First World Order Radio, finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Proceeding in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceeding in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient history school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. Peace, peace. Once again, you back with Dr. Aleem Bay. Tonight's show is going to be fire, fire, fire. We got Brother Metaphysician um, Mike Pratt on. Brother Mike, are you here? Yeah, what's going on, Alain? All right, all right. We ready for you to get into the um, topic of subjects of the cartoons and metaphysically decoding them, in particular one cartoon. I know um, we all was inspired in a sense, you know, as far as, um, you know, learning the science of Qigong, Pranic Healing, Reiki, all this information. You oh, know, yeah. A cartoon in particular was, um, of course, Dragon Ball, you know, of course, and the spinoffs from that, you know, Dragon Ball, um, GT, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball, um, Kai, all of them. That was, a, that was all my shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, that's right. I, that's what I grew up on. I mean, you know, I would watch that every day coming home from school, you know. Did, right, did right. you grow up on, on those particular, or were you more, because I know you were born, what, the 60s, right? Yeah, well, I was born 69, yeah, so almost in the yeah. 70s, but yeah. Um, really, I mean, I was watching them too, you know, because um, I was also learning Qigong um, at the time, you know, in the early 90s. So, I mean, um, all those cartoons were, you know, basically dealing with the same thing I was learning. So I was watching them and see if there was any metaphysics, you know, in which that was dropped, you know. And, of course, oh, I mean, yeah. and that's why we're here tonight in order to get on that particular topic of, um, you know, the metaphysics, the esoteric teachings in which that was dropped in these particular cartoons. You know, in particular, Dragon Ball. I mean, so what's your science on the symbolism behind the seven, um, you know, balls in which they, they was always looking for, and once they found all seven, they was able to get, you know, granted a wish, you know, or, you know, or particular wishes, you know. So, you know, break that down for us. Well, I actually wanted to tell you the funny thing is because I actually, what I'm saying, what I'm going to say on this show tonight, I wanted to say that since the first time I talked to you on the phone. <laughs> All right. But um uh, basically, yeah, so I mean you have uh the Namekians. The Namekians, those are those uh those green beings that you see from Planet Namek. Right. They have like little antennas on their head. They right. created the Dragon Balls, right? So you have seven different 
Dragon Ball, you gather them together, and Shenron, which Shenron, we of course know in Japan, Shen is like a um, dragon, uh, or dragon spirit, or dragon god, and so basically that is symbolic to, um, that's symbolic to the chakras. And right. if you know from... And the Kundalini. Uh, yeah, and, and the Kundalini rising, that's, that's Shenron, because when you at least when it comes to the sexual magic or anything like that, you know, you put whatever you want to manifest, you know, basically, you know, that's your wish. Or Aladdin with the genie or, you know, whatever. Same type of same type of thing. Of course, they're not going to, I mean, it's a kiss show. They're not going to be talking about sexual magic, but they give you a clue, you know, this is the way it's done. Right, and what are some of the clues in which that um you was able to pick up from it, you know, from a child, and now looking back at it, you know, as a and as an adult, you know, you know what what was it, you know, that even interest interested you in, um, Dragon Ball. Well, it plays a lot, um, you know, on the mythologies of, of I mean, a lot of movies. I, I mean, it. it it can go back to Egyptian mythology. It can go to Greek. Um, I mean, Goku was pretty much like a child. You know what I'm saying? And he had a father named Bardock, or I think um, was it Bardaku. That's either in Japanese or whatever. And his father died by Frieza, right? So Frieza let off this huge, you know, energy blast and and that killed Bardock. And Goku comes down here on a spaceship, and, you know what I'm saying, that his grandfather, Gohan, finds him you know, in this pod. I mean, he accidentally ends up killing his grandfather because he turns into Uzaru. And Uzaru, you know, that's the monkey king. Uh, especially in Asia, there's like a monkey king. But also in India, I think, what's that, Hanuman. Right, Hanuman. Hanuman. And right. That, Even within uh, ancient Egypt, they had um, Hanuman as um, the symbol of the baboon for Tahuti. So that's where it um, originated from, definitely. And it symbolizes wisdom. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because it's always on a full moon, you know, when he turns into that. Right, and, and the symbol uh, of Tahuti was, was the moon. <laughs> was the moon. He was the moon guy. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, I was going to say, because, I mean, the interesting thing is, is that he goes, and he doesn't know it necessarily, but he goes to kill, um, you know, his brother. Remember his brother Raditz? Right. So his Raditz comes to the planet. Now, this is beyond Dragon Ball. This is Dragon Ball Z. Uh, this is after, like, fighting Piccolo and everything, and basically, but his brother comes and is saying, like, you know what I'm saying, you're, you're a Saiyan, you're supposed to be, why, why do you show love to these human beings, you know, you're a Saiyan, you're supposed to be blowing up planets and shit like that, you know, and, you know, I mean, Goku loved Earth, and he loved, you know, human beings, and he was, he was not doing that, but as you can see, that, what that reminds me is, um, Horace and Seth, or the story of the two brothers. That's right. Um, and then, of course, you know, I, he has to get Piccolo, <laughs> and Piccolo does, you know, that special being canon, um, kills Goku and Raditz. And then, after you go past that episode, you know, you see Goku in what they call the other world, and he has to, <laughs> All right, well, he has to run a... Right, when we get into that, I mean, the whole science is, that is Egyptian mythology. I mean, that is um, also who, um, in his awakened form, is Hiru, who ends up fighting his brother, you know, or uncle in that um, certain case as Set, you know, because the battle originally was between Osa and Set, or Osiris and Sut, you know. Um, however, um, Hiru picked it up as being the incarnation of Osa, and, you know, that battle waged until Tahuti, you know, who um, acted as the mediator, 
you know, between the two ended up having to unify them, you know, and, you know, and the way the battle was won was because the eye of Heru was returned to him, you know, hence like, you know, uh, symbolic to the Dragon Balls actually, and when that eyeball was returned, you know, he was able to transform himself into the Uraeus, or what is known as Washisha. And as the Washisha, um, he was able to defeat and cause Set to merge, you know, the lower nature into um, the higher nature or the lower self into the higher self. So when we're looking at that story, you know, we know that um, our saw who was the lord of the conscious world and of, you know, um, when he was, quote, unquote, alive, but as he was yeah. killed by Set, he became the lord of the underworld. You know what I'm saying? Same as Goku, you know, did as he was, um, like, the supreme being here on Earth until he was taken out by a, in an alien force, you know, in a sense. And, you know, and he became the lord of the, um, you know, of heaven, too. So it's symbolic to becoming the lord of heaven and Earth. So that 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 is very heavy within the mythologies, you know, whether it's coming from ancient Egypt or which is, you know, um, actually originated as, you know, the Kushite, you know, um, traditions, you know, and, you know, and then, of course, as it comes, you know, with the, even within the Greek, the Roman tales and so forth and so on, it, it definitely has, um, you know, has spanned the times. Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm just surprised that I mean, he's Japanese, the writer of Akira Toriyama, I'm just surprised that he put that much in there. I yeah, mean, that's was what a, made that show so great. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. It was definitely one of the greatest um, cartoons of all times, as far as I'm as as far as I'm concerned. Um, I mean, even I mean that I mean you had a cartoon in which that adults was watching and talking about. You know, I mean that that is that is <laughs> that is definitely um something. You know, for you you know to have adults talking about cartoons. You know, and that was everywhere. That was all over the country, you know. So that was definitely um, um, very powerful. And like I said, that was one of the instrumental forces in which that um, I think a lot of people began to start learning and practicing Qigong and Tai Chi, you know, um, and different energy modalities. You know, what's because oh, yeah. that influence? Because, right, because I was trying to do that when I was when I was younger. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was trying to make energy balls. And then right. once I got introduced to, once I, I actually felt my own energy for the first time, and I mean, it wasn't wind, when I actually felt, you know, like an orb in between my hands, then I was like, wow, okay. Right, and what was you doing in order to um, produce that? What did you do? Well, at, at first, I mean, what I would do is, you know, because I mean, in Dragon Ball, they're always getting energy. They're always getting angry to bring out their energy. Right. You know, in Qigong, you don't necessarily have to do that. You want to be calm. But what mm-hmm. I was doing is just basically focusing on the energy in between uh, my palms. Like Gohan tells Fidel, I don't know if you've seen that, when Gohan's trying to uh, train Fidel, he basically says the same thing that you would do in Qigong, you focus on your, you know, navel center, and you kind of just bring it out, you know, just like that. Right, and what people fail to realize is that that is one of the storage places for this um, chi or ki or prana, you know, um, energy, you know, which is the universal life force energy, and what you're doing is bringing the universe down or the cosmic energy down or the heavenly forces down into you and making it earthly force. You know, so so that's how you are merging heaven and earth is by bringing those energies into yourself. And um, as people who have melanin, I mean, um, this is the thing which that we definitely need to be doing because that's why we was gifted with it. You know, and so as you bring it down into your navel chakra, that is one of the storage places. There's three in particular. Um, you know, you have your navel, you have your heart, and you have your third eye. Those are the three places in which that you place this energy or prana or chi or ki energy. And when you place it in your navel, it, it it gives you the extension of your life force. In other words, it it can um, make you live longer. You add years to your life. It can even, um, in some, you know, of course, when you study the Taoist, you know, teachings, there's eight immortals. So the number eight become prevalent, and it's no coincidence that that energy is tapping into the eight 
um, cells of um, of division, which is called the eight blastopores, in which that is the remnants of what formed your physical body, you know, into you know manifestation, you know, from you know from a, um, amoeba, you know, um, embryo slash into a fetus, and now into you know a baby, or you know going through puberty and now an adult, you know, it came from those eight particular blastopores, you know, so hence. You know, we see the correlation with that. You know, and even in ancient Kemet, we had um, the eight, you know, um, deities, you know, from the, um, called the Akhenides, you know, or Agadad, you know, in which that, you know, stemming from Atum, you had Shu, Tefnut, Geb, Nut, Osar, Oset, um, Nebhet, and Set, you know, so those eight. Symbolic to those eight divine cells of mitosis, in which they form atom or atom into physical existence. I just wanted to get that in there. No doubt, no doubt. And, and if you know, in Dragon Ball, well, I mean, you already know. Most people know. Tien has a third eye. Right. Well, what move does he do? He puts his hands in front of his third face eye. or third eye. Yeah. <laughs> does the um, Solar flare. Mm. Now that, that's interesting because I mean we've been talking about you know solar flares for so long, but not just that. I mean, telling you the keys, you know where you can you can use the solar flare. You know you can store it in your upper dantian. Right, right, yeah. right. That's that's oh, Christians refer to that as the upper room. So you know they love talking about the upper room. Where they gonna go to the upper room? And I'm like, you, you just don't know. That is the upper room. The third eye is the upper room. And um, like you said, that's one of the definitely places in which that you store the solar um, um, flare energy at. You know, as it comes through um, the hair follicles and comes down into the skull and you know um, meets with the pineal gland, which is the master gland of the endocrine gland system of the whole body, actually. Um, and that is our, you know, um, driving force is the pineal gland. That's the that's the um, eye in which that we actually use, in which that, you know, give us direction, you know, and biofeedback, and you know, our sleep patterns, and all of these things are, you know, are from, you know, um, the pineal gland, and give us access to communication with the ancestors. That's how you remember they was able to um, hear Goku, you know, um, when he was in heaven on Earth. Krillin and all of them was able to hear him, you know, mentally, telepathically. So they showed you even in there um, telecommunications um, um, between the ancestral forces and, you know, between man. Yep, and they could, and they could sense power levels. Mm-hmm. And that, that has nothing to do with who has bigger biceps. I mean, that's about your energy, mm-hmm. you know, I mean. I mean, it's nice to have big biceps, but I mean, it's really talking about your aura, your energy, and that's what they they pick up on each other's energy. Yeah, and that's so no coincidence that, that um, with the Pranic Healing, we have three different techniques: the empty retention, the um, seven one seven one, and the six three six three breath, um, Pranic breathing or breath technique, in which that expands your orbit field from three feet to fifteen feet outside the body. Some masters has even mastered the technique to extending their auric field a mile. So you know that uh, what that's saying is, if you want to get with the Dragon Ball Z. You need to be doing your 63. <laughs> That's right. You know what I'm saying? That's right. You need, need to be doing that. Right. Um, I was going to get into a little bit more in the Dragon Ball before we switch over to the, uh, I mean, shit, I got a whole, a whole lot. We got about an hour, right? Yeah, yeah. We got 40 um, minutes. So hit it up. Go. All right. So, you know, I mean, I was reading the Internet is a great resource. Uh, <laughs> but basically what I was saying is um, the Saiyans, you know what I'm saying, the Saiyans lived, basically, they were, they were an ancient, so-called ancient civilization that got wiped out. And later they became, you know, you see all the sands, you know, they all have a tail. 
you know, symbolizing that either that baboon, uh, which is Tahuti, or uh, if there were, and we're not we're not talking about like going back to apes. This is stuff you got to decode. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but basically, you know, this civilization was wiped out, and that's supposedly what made them. I mean, they were aggressive from the start, but this civilization got wiped out. And then later, you know, they came back as sands, and I mean, they destroyed planets and all types of things like that. But when Goku came, I mean, Goku was a sand, but he came in a pod, and he learned from the ways of human, and he was trained by his grandfather... You see what I'm saying? And, I mean, you just have so much, so much things with that show. I mean, Krillin, Krillin is like a, you know, that's like a monk. I mean, if you see from, from the very beginning of Dragon Ball, right? Yep. So Krillin, I mean, Krillin is like a monk. Uh, I mean, and um, they learn from Master Roshi who is, like, this hermit that lives on an island. And what do you say it is, like, it took me, like, 50 or something years to master the uh, Kamehameha wave. But, I mean, what is all breaking down in there is, you know, you take, you know, I mean, people will say, you know, why are you going to the Dragon Ball on this? Why are you going to little kids shows? They knew that little kids would pick up on it subconsciously and adults would just be like, this is, there's no point in watching this. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because they knew that they put, as far as the 90s shows, the stuff that I grew up on, they put heavy metaphysics into all of those shows because they knew that the kids, the kids were the only ones that were going to pick up on it and, I mean, their kundalini was crazy. When You know, when you were little, you just had so much energy, and you were, you know, running all over the place. Yep. People said, hey, your parents would be like, you know, sit down. That's you right. You know, just, you down. just calm down. That's right. Be like my grandma, sit your ass down somewhere. Yeah, sit your ass down. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and but I mean, when I was little, you know, I mean, when we'd be on the playground, I mean, we'd be, I mean, this kid was like a, we would, we would be had, throwing energy blasts at each other, uh, we, we'd be training each other, I mean, we'd be hitting and kicking each other, we were, of course, just playing around, I mean, we weren't intentionally trying to hurt each other, but I mean, just the power that it had. I mean, we would be in in a different dimension. You know what I mean? Just having these battles. That's right. And and we didn't care about... It's because I feel that that was part of the pineal gland that made it like that. Right. I feel because it probably wasn't, you know... I mean, because you, you weren't so caught up in the illusion that, you know, you you had your imagination and everything was a wonder to you. You see what I'm saying? That's right. That's what makes it so powerful. But the funny thing that I'm going to tell you about is because, see, I was born around, say, 93. So, basically, in the 90s, they said that different kids were being born with, um, or kids were being born with a different type of DNA structure or something like that. Right. Right? So, supposedly, now, I mean, I'm not going too much into the new age, but supposedly they were called the, uh, the indigo. Right, the indigo. And then, of course, we have the crystal and the rainbow children, you know, and... Actually, 
Some say that it actually started um, after World War II, where where the ancestors found it necessary in order to re-encode the DNA, in order to be a real reawaken within um, the individuals who was able to go beyond just the physical realm consciousness, you know, and, and who wanted to find something much more deeper and more meaningful in life. And so, as they are on this search, certain DNA um, codes will reawaken within them, and you know, and therefore, you know, we started developing more than just two strands of DNA. And based on what has been, you know, studied, there are children being born, as you said, who are the so-called indigo children, rainbow children, or the um, crystal children who have three strands of DNA. You know, um, there's a book called The Super Psychics of China, and which that in the book it specifically speak about this um, this little um, Chinese guy um, you know who? Uh, they, he's cool, you know. <laughs> okay, they refer to him no, as a little god. And what happened was is that one of the, I guess you know, I guess bodyguards or whatever the case is, started messing with him, and he told him, you know, basically, you know, that if you don't stop messing with me, I'm gonna take, um, you know, I'm gonna take your money in your in his, in your pocket and put it in his pocket, you know, and vice versa, you know, whatever the case is, and. You know, he and basically he was telling him like, look, if you don't stop messing with me, you know, I can seriously mess you up. And so, you know, he did it right. for him and took the dude's money, you know, that was in his, you know, his pocket, you know, the, you know, and put it in the other guy's pocket, you know, mentally, yeah. you know, and you know, they say that these children are able to fill up glass, you know, with air, you know, make condense the water in the, you know, the um, you know the air, you know, into water and fill up a glass, you know. So, I mean, these are things which that is going on right now. And the more that you practice Qigong or Tai Chi, the more that these abilities reawaken within you. So we talk about, you know, children who, you know, 15, 16 generations of, you know, Qigong and Tai Chi expertise, you know, what we refer to now as Kung Fu, you know, and the word Kung means to develop, you know. Um, so, you right. know, cultivate, you know, Qigong means to, um, means energy or breath work or energy development or cultivation. So, you know, that Kong, you know, which is short for Kundalini, you know, is the power in which that you are unleashing, you know, in order to be able to do these particular things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was I was gonna say that and, you know because people people have said that to me I never really considered myself one I mean I was just born in the nineties and I mean I'm pretty sure that I'm a pretty I mean I don't say that I have ego I'm just pretty sure that I'm an evolved soul you know what I'm saying like I just I don't fall for the bullshit you know. Are you still there, Lynn? Oh, yeah, we here. Keep it popping. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, um, yeah, uh, and it's like, I, I just, I don't know, fall for it. And ever since I was a kid, it, I mean, it was just really hard to, for adults to kind of tell me, you know, there's a difference for just, just being rebellious, but it's like something in me sensed. You know, this is for control. This is only for control. This is limiting my imagination. This is, you know, limiting my creativity. You know, all these sorts of things. And, I mean, it always seemed to come from adults. But just the way that my soul was or, you know, I mean, the way I was, um, you know, I just I never fall for it. You know what I'm saying? The nonsense and the lies. Especially when I was really young and I saw those planes um, hit the towers. You know what I'm saying? I I always felt that was staged. Yeah, I know we didn't see enough um, buildings fall down demolition style in order to know that that was rigged. But of course, those who did, who's never seen it or never paid attention, then of course, you know, they fell for the okie dokie. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's just from a kid. 
like, it's just certain things, like, I just, I wouldn't fall for them, you know. I wouldn't say that that necessarily makes me an indigo, but I was just, I just, I, I could sense certain things, you know, and I knew if they were true and if people were really coming from the heart when they said it, and I knew, you know, if they were lying. You know what I'm saying? Like a salesman hardly could ever get me whenever they call. Or just, you know, whoever. But um, I was going to say, um, the funny thing is, is, I know you said that you heard about Pokemon, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the interesting thing is now, I mean, they messed up the show now. Now the show is just whack. It's nothing like I knew whenever, you know, I was growing up. I mean, and that was an awesome show, too. Um, but basically, the funny thing is, the first league that they had in the first episode was called the Indigo League. You know, and you got to collect these certain badges by beating certain gym leaders. Now, each gym leader is a certain element. So, I mean, you had rock, uh, fire, earth each of the elements, and each Pokemon uh, possessed that certain power, you know, within them. Um, The thing that's interesting about Pokemon is if you go back to the first movie, basically, this came out in, like, 1999, right? Right. So this this was the first movie. Now, if you remember, um, okay, so they... There was this original uh, Pokemon that nobody had ever seen called Mew. Now, this Pokemon had the DNA of every single Pokemon. Now, they created this clone from it, which was basically an extraction from the original Mew, and they called it Mew 2. Now, Mew 2, of course, his abilities was... Psychic. I mean, he he could perform any attack, but these were psychic Pokemon. And basically, um, they the scientists, the Mew was already, you know, from the beginning. And Mew, you actually see if you watch the movie, you see him in a um, in a hieroglyph. And if you look at the Pokemon card, he's in a hieroglyph. Now, I mean, that could either be Heru or I'm pretty sure because, you see, Mewtwo, because the way that they play it off in the movie, it's Horus and Set again. But Mewtwo is is pissed off because he feels that, you know, he wasn't wasn't original and um, he basically was created to serve humans or whatever, and he said, no, like, you know, like, I'm going to take this shit for myself. So he takes, he, they go into this stadium. I don't know. Have you seen this movie before, Lee? Elaine? Yeah, we here. Come on. Oh, no, I'm saying, have you seen this movie before? Yeah, I've seen the first one. Oh, okay. All right, so mm-hmm. he gets he gets all these clones. Um, so I mean, the Pokemon trainers Ash and all them have to go to the stadium, and they go there to meet Mewtwo. And you'll see all these black balls with eyes come and capture all the Pokemon, then make them into clones. And so basically, you know, the original Pokemon versus the clones. And they'll each be battling each other. And, I mean, even though it's Pokemon, <laughs> if you were a kid, it was, it was sad to watch. But these Pokemon would be just really attacking each other to the point that they couldn't attack each other anymore. And then, you know what I mean? I mean, they'd be crying, and they'd be attacking each other to the point where they couldn't attack each other anymore. And then... And then Ash, who is the, you know, hero in the movie, 
runs in between because he wants to save, you know, I mean, his best friend, Pikachu, and he gets turned into stone. And then, um, you know, Mew is basically telling Mewtwo all the time that, you know what I mean? Like, you just, you haven't learned yet. You don't know what heart is. And Mewtwo is all about the ego. You know, he's always about, you know, basically, you know, I, I wasn't created to serve humans. You know, I'm not a clone. I'm not just an experiment. So, I mean, he's pissed off. But what happens in the movie is, you know, I mean, of course this is something you got to have to decode. But through all the tears of the Pokemon and the energy, brings Ash back to life. And then Mewtwo basically realizes this this is madness trying to get the original Pokemon to go against clones and saying, you know what I'm saying, basically, um, you know, he, he takes all his clones with him and he flies away and he says, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not, the circumstances where one's birth is irrelevant. It's what you do with the gift of life that, you know, it determines who you are. You know? I mean, that was a deep movie, man. Yeah, yeah, that's profound right there. No doubt about it. Yep. And I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's showing, because I say this, I mean, I mean, at one point, I'm sure, well, I mean, just the school, they always had this type of thing where it's just like, it always seemed, you know, like the white kids, you know what I'm saying? If you weren't white, it, people would almost frown upon you, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. I mean, not not, not people of, of color, but I'm saying people, white people. Right would almost frown upon you. Now, the weird thing is, I would used to think, you know what I'm saying, that I was. And at one point, I thought, like, I wanted to be because, you know, I was just tired of, like, people always from the color, you know, and shit like that. You know what I mean? And then, you know, I mean, of course, as I became conscious, then I'm like, well, if I didn't have, you know, this, the sun would be fucking me up right now. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, no, I mean, it, it's a blessing. But what I, it's saying, though, I mean, the true message is that, now, I, I mean, I know, I mean, of course, you know, I mean, there's a, an advantage. And, I mean, it's better to be original. But it's just saying, it's really what's in your soul and in your heart that makes you who you are. Everything else is just, you know, like an illusion, like you said. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, even within the occult, you know, realm, I mean, um, the only thing in which that is real, you know, is the soul, you know, which is God, you know, in which that inhibits the physical body, and the body is the temple of God. So um, the temple itself, you know, comes through, um, the earthly elements coming together in some shape, form, or fashion and being composed or held together by the breath itself, which is centrifugal and centrifugal force. So when we talk about the soul, of course, within Hebrew, they refer to it as a ruku or ro, you know, in which that is derived from the ancient Egyptian word ra, you know. Um, so, you know, the soul is ra, and of course, you know, um, in its various aspects, whether it's atum ra or Ra or um, Amin Ra, you know, those are nothing more than various forms of Ra. Ra is known as the oldest um, god or the oldest deity, you know what I'm saying, um, in ancient Kemet. Matter of fact, even within Hebrew today, they still refer to God as Ra, you know. So, you know, there there, there is, you know, um, you know that's, that's the science on the soul. And being that, you know, even... We, when we come in tune with this consciousness and information, you know, people will have to realize that. They say, oh, you know, you might be look young, you know what I'm saying, but they have to realize, they say, oh, man, you got an old soul. You know, when they see and, you know, right. when they come with you and they, 
you know, what that old soul is talking about, Ra. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Ra is the oldest deity, the oldest um, natural you know, of the natural rules, you know, um, you know, within the Egyptian mythology or pantheon. So, you know, when we talk, you know, about that, we, we have to realize, you know, what we really are saying, you know, and so the soul comes within man. And one of the, um, one of the things in which that verifies that is the activation of the pineal gland, you know, so that the soul can escape, you know what I'm saying? So, the soul has the tendency of breaking out the shell of the body, you know what I'm saying? And that is through, you know, um, being conscious and through the raising, you know, or the ascension of the Kundalini itself, which is the feminine mother principle, you know, within your physical body. You know, it's the concentration of prana, you know, um, at the base of your spine, you know, at what is known as the um, sacral, you know, bone area. You know, um, which is right above the caucus or the tail part, you know, or the hind part, you know, above the crack of the ass, really. You know, and exactly. right, so that is the abode, you know, of the Kotalini. And so as she is awakened, she symbolizes or set within the Egyptian mythology or Tamarain or Kometan uh, mythology. And as she goes and through the seven caves looking for the body parts of our saw to bring him back together again in order to make him whole. You know, as she journeyed through those seven caves, that symbolizes the seven chakras, you know, just like the seven dragon balls. And so as she right. um, comes to the last, you know, place or cavern, you know, within the Sanskrit is known as um, the cave of Brahma. You know what I'm saying? Within the Bible, Abraham is nothing more than a form of Brahma. And Abraham... Uh-huh. Um, you know, becomes the father of many nations or many seeds, you know, and his wife is known as Sarah. What well, is no coincidence that Brahma wife is called Sarah, you know, as in Sarah Swati. So, right. Yeah, so whenever people realize, you know, the biblical mythology, you know, and, and how it's connected to world mythology, then we begin to, you know, heighten our consciousness. But there's been a stop you know, of this, you know, purposely from the various Christian belief system, from the Islamic belief system, from the Judaism belief system, in order to keep us, you know, wrangled within that one, you know, particular thought system, you know, known as the monothe- uh, monotheistic belief system. And so when we break out of that, that's when the soul can actually journey because um, it seems that those, you know, the way in which that is being told in those particular belief system is actually a form of hell, you know, or right. you know, um, Kutalini being held down, as I would say, you know, um, and as it's being held down, you can't break the confines of the physical body, and you can't journey into the astral plane or the soul plane in order to, you know, to meet with the ancestors or communicate with the ancestors or, you know, and this is done, you know, Actually, in a sense, naturally as children, but as we um, age because of all the de- negative debris and because of all the um, environment and the negative forces, you know, um, you know, the, especially the bioplasmic negative energy in which that accumulates around our own auric field, it stops us from being able to um, make these particular journeys in order to find, you know, um, real answers or go into what is called the Akashic Records. And I think that's one reason why um, Ash was called Ash within the Pokemon was because um, of the word Akashic, you know, which that, you yeah. know, uh, means that's the that's the record place. That's the universal library. That's where we go uh, when we close our eyes at night and we are able to, you know, close our two physical eyes but yet still see a whole other world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, if you see on the first episode, when all that's done after he just fought a spirit, spirit um, it was a bunch of spear holes trying to attack Pikachu. You know what I'm saying? That's the electric mouse. After all that's done, when there's a rainbow, he sees this golden bird named Ho-Oh. You heard of that before? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The very first episode. You know, there's there's a rainbow, and he sees, and he sees Ho-Oh. Now, I could be wrong, but that looks awfully, uh, I mean, awfully familiar to me. And it's called Ho-Oh. Right. And it's a phoenix. Right. A phoenix. Right. Um, and, it, and it's no coincidence that it just makes almost the sound, um, um, 
uh, phonetically as, as the sound of which that Santa Claus is supposed to say, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. In which that he symbolizes Saturn, in which that symbolizes the Kundalini um, at the base of the spine, in which that is the symbol or the element is lead, in which that as the sun comes down, you know, within um, the three days, it stands still in the sky, known as the winter solstice, in which that we just went um, by December 21st through 24th, and then on the 25th, it begins its ascension from out of the grave or tomb, as it is referred to as, back into being birthed once again nine months later in the month of September under the month, you know, under um, the sign of Virgo, the zodiac sign of Virgo, in which that Virgo is the virgin. So hence Mary birthing Jesus once again, you know, so this, so that story is ever coming astrologically, you know, and so these are just things in which that, you know, when we do our research, we can, you know, um, put this um, put this shit together, you know, and make some sense out of it. But as long as, you know, people are trying to fight, you know, battle each other back and forth, you know, um, having these little Facebook wars and shit, you know, um, you know, really, you know, they, they don't really get concrete information what they need to because they um not doing enough research, you know, so. Right, you will, you will mm-hmm. get more. I mean, you, I'm not saying, but you will get more just watching just watching these shows where I've been drawing energy for probably the last couple of years has been from Dragon Ball. And it's just because they put so much in there and there's just there's so much energy and there's so much inspiration that you can draw. Now we're going to get into the uh, Namekians if we still have some time. Yeah, we do. All right, so the Namekians, you know, those are the green people. So green. What are you saying? No, go ahead. Oh, the uh, the Namekian people uh, are the green green beings. Uh, look kind of like um, you know they have these antennas, and these were the original people that uh, or beings that created the, uh, the Dragon Balls, and they have antennas you know, on their heads, and basically, I mean, um, you know, I mean, you could go to the green, that could be symbolic to chlorophyll or melanin or, I mean, but these are the people that created the Dragon Balls. So they are the creator of what comes out to be Shenron or the dragon or the Naga. So, I mean... But when you really go into it, it's interesting because these are, like, really um, calm and peaceful people on planet Namek. You know what I'm saying? Dende, who's there, um, he's the healer. And he'll heal, you know, I mean, any sand that was wounded or in battle, he'll wound, uh, I mean, he'll heal them. Um, and so, and then there there was Kami, if you remember Kami, that's a really <laughs> old ass looking, um, you right. know. And there's no coincidence that the word Kami comes from the word Cam, in which that is Ham, which is one of the names biblically of um, Egypt, you know, as well as also, um, you know, like you said, being a healer. So they're telling you right there that the information comes from Egypt, you know, um, being the old, you know, the in other words, being the ancient one. You know, that's the story of the ancient one, Melchizedek. You know, the word Mel within um, Greek means black. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, and he was known, Melchizedek within the Bible was known as the Ancient of Days. You know, so he was the old one. Like I said, symbolic to Ra once again. But, um, you know, you know, as it spread out throughout the um, particular stories, you know, as these stories spread out throughout the um, different, you know, um, I guess you could say religions or languages, it takes on, you know, another form. That's why you have to do comparative religious study in order to see how all of these stories connect, you know, whether it's biblically um, coming from the um, Hebrew, coming from the Christian, coming from, um, yeah, you know, exactly. Buddhism, Shintoism, Taoism, you know, um, mm-hmm. Zoroasterism, you know, all of these stories connect, and there was nothing more than the same stories told over and over again, and some of the names might change, but you know, most of the time the plot or the story remains the same. 
You know, it's just like the story yeah. of um, you know, like we have of um, you know, Superman. You know, every time we 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 can see another Superman story coming. You know, Hancock was a Superman story. You know, yeah. um, if you want to say, it. but you know, Superman was based on the original Superman story, which was Hero. You know, which the word hero is derived from. So anytime you see a story about heroes, you actually is not getting, getting nothing more than the original story from Heru. From Heru, yeah. Exactly. And um, I was going to say, because, um, I mean, of course you have Dead Day, and you have Mr. Popo, if you remember that guy. I think he has like a turban on or something. Yeah, he does. And Piccolo does too. And you always see Piccolo, you know what I'm saying? Uh, right, symbolic med- to the Moors. Med- right, that was symbolic yeah. to the Moors, right. And people don't realize that, you know, Mr. Popo, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, um, with symbolic, you know, <laughs> and they show you, you know, black and then with the lips and everything, you know, looking like a um, um, H.O., you know, um, character from the Bugs Bunny, you know, cartoons, but, you know, he was the one in which that gave helpful advice as well as also, you know, dynamic, you know, um, he was able to, you know, do all types of things. And he always would take his fingers and put to his third eye whenever he uh, was um, doing astral projection and, you know, and different things like that, if you remember. So they always showed you that um, then with the turban on, symbolic to the moors, but also the abilities or the capabilities in which that we possess, you know, if we actually, you know, utilize our, you know, melanin, which is, of course, the difference between melanin and chlorophyll is only one magnesium molecule. The, um, the, the, um, the, the, actually, the molecules look identical, except at the center is one um, within iron, you know, within melanin is iron, and within um, chlorophyll is magnesium. So there's only one magnesium molecule difference. Wow. Yeah, I've heard I've heard that. Um, I was going to say that um, where they always uh, go if, if they need to train, it's very similar. Now, you'll see Kami there, and if you remember in the Dragon Ball, Goku had to catch this cat. Right. right now, I that cat. That. Mm-hmm. Now, you, you'll see that cat in uh, Asian culture. You'll see that cat uh, uh, in Egyptian culture, I mean, that could be Bosset, I mean, that could be right. so many things, but remember he had to catch this cat, and this cat had the sensu beam, and the sensu beam would restore all your energy, you know, I mean, if you were, like, I mean, about to faint or die or something, you know, they had those sensu beams. Right, after but, they get their right, I remember, after they get their butts whipped, whipped up real bad by, um, other beings, they always needed to um, send you being in order to, um, you know, rejuvenate themselves. Right. Mm-hmm. I remember that. You know, and that's no coincidence that the word, um, you know, is connected to the word shen, in which that means spirit, like we was talking about before. So what it does is revitalize, you know, the um, physical aspect of the spirit, which is the physical body, you know, um, you know, and the materialistic um, aspect of the spirit, I should say, which is the physical body. And interestingly, you know, when we look at that, you know, it shows you about the science of um, herbology in that regard, in which that is real well known within the Orient, you know, um, that when you practice Qigong or or Qi, you know, um, you have to study medicine, which is talking about herbology, along with it you know, as well as acupressure and acupuncture, you know, in order to know the various meridians and nadis, you know, um, within the physical body so that you can um, redistribute, you know, energy to deficient areas and, you know, and cool down excessive heated areas within the body. So these are just things in which that, um, obviously, that since you being, you know, that's obviously what it used, you know, was, was put in the cartoon for was to help master, you know, or to um, give us the, you know, inkling of what was really taking place. Yeah, I wonder if he was channeling a lot of this. I mean, because, I mean, there's just so much in there. I think he was a student, you know, of Qigong, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think he he studied. I I think that's what, you know, 
the information was really, you know, what was about. Do you, you think know? he brought any of this information, you know, from his ancestors or from the spirit world? Um, you know, partially, I mean, when you do some type of study, I mean, remember within um, the Asian culture, they have traditions in a culture in which that transmit orally stories, you know what I'm saying, about their mothers and fathers and, you know, grandmothers and great-grandfathers and, you know, so forth and so on. You know, and if you come, you know, within that particular um, lineage, you know, and if they was practitioners of Qigong, Gatai Chi, or Kung Fu, or whatever the case is, then, you know, definitely more than likely you would get that information, you know, especially in the events, you know, Kung Fu, that's what you learn. Remember, if you go back and watch um, Master Killer, um, 36 Chambers, you know, going yeah. through, you know, ran up in the damn highest temple, you know, where they was damn beating on, um, you know, um, you know, brass bowls, you know, and, you know, enchanting, you know, and, he, you know, he running up in there to the priest, to the um, to the high priest, to the abbot, talking yeah. about, I want to learn Kung Fu, you know, and the abbot was like, out. And he wouldn't move. He was still standing there. And he said, out. And then on the third one, he just took his etheric body and just pushed his ass down in order to make him go out. You know, and so when he runs out, you know, he runs into the priest in which that, you know, that he asked, you know, to go into the highest. And he said, he said, I don't know what that is, but that's not Kung Fu. And the priest told me, he said, that's the highest Kung Fu you ever learned. Oh, yeah. See, that's why I went, uh, well, I mean, I did learn, uh um, I did learn Taekwondo, but I used to kick so high, I only got it to about the blue belt, where I, like, pulled, like, a, I don't know, I, I pulled, like, a hamstring or something, and I was just, like, walking real funny, you know, for the <laughs> next, um, you know, couple of months or so, I had to get therapy and stuff. I only got to about blue, uh, blue belt with the Taekwondo, but I only... That's why I wanted to get into the Qigong because I felt, I mean, yeah, I mean, I learned, you know, I mean, different styles from friends and stuff like that, but I felt like the Qigong was the most important Kung Fu. Right, right. You well, know what I'm saying? Ori- it's the origin of the of the um, heart style. It's the soft style. You know, I mean, that's that's how um, the heart style came. Matter of fact, um, Bodhidharma um, brought it from out of um, India, as he was descended from the um, Kushite people from out of Africa, um, you know, and as Bodhidharma traveled into Asia, he taught the priests what is called the eighteen hand, um, 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 the eighteen hands of Lohan, and that was like the first Qigong, you know, and he had to teach them because the priests was for you know these members and priests. You know, uh, students was falling asleep while they supposed to have been practicing, you know what I'm saying, or meditating, <laughs> you know. And right. so, so he realized that, you know, he had to get them moving meditation, you know, in order to correct themselves, you know. And so, you know, that's how Qigong, you know, um, was utilized in which that soon became known as the 18 Hands of Lohan, you know, in which that, be, you know, which is the origin of what we now know as, of course, Tai Chi and, of course, Wing Chun and, Qigong and, you know, well, excuse me, um, Kung Fu and so forth and so on. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, the art form. See, that's what I love about it because, I mean, it's art. Right. And that, mm-hmm. that's what makes it, you know, it's creative. There's no, there's no stagnation to it. Right. Well, do me a favor, we're getting ready to go to the second half, but what we want you to do is definitely break down on what you're studying now as far as the Qigong. I know recently um, you got certified, you know what I'm saying, um, Qigong 1, you know, so, um, you know, um, tell us about that and the event in which that happened. Oh, yeah. Okay, so basically, you know, I mean, it came through, it came through the Dragon Ball, which that gave me the idea that it was at least possible. You know, I had, before I just thought it was, you know, just maybe some type of, you know, I mean, people would just make it seem like it wasn't real. And, I mean, I remember just being young and, like, trying to turn out candles and throwing energy balls and, and trying to turn out candles, you know, from stuff I saw on YouTube. 
And, um, but once I, so I I started practicing at, what's it called, the Art of Qigong by Wong Vu Kit. Right. So I was practicing that, and I would feel kind of like a, kind of like a sensation, but I, I started thinking, like, you know, because when you're doing certain stuff, your logical mind is always trying to say, you know, I mean, this is this isn't doing anything. You know, I mean, it, it just won't shut up sometimes, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, so the more I began practicing it, you know, I mean, I began to feel like a sensation, but it was never so continuous. It's like I would try to have a schedule where I do it continuous and I would do it as much as I can when I was just busy, you know, doing different things. But when I went to the Qigong rep, we practiced like the whole day. That's all we that's all we did. Uh myself and my mother went there and they taught us, you know, they taught us what's called tumo they they taught us what was called tumo breathing. They taught us um, basically, this whole thing takes about an hour, but this will... Right, and for those energy. who don't know what Tumo breathing is, what it does is um, from the certain breath technique, what you do is put fire into your belly. In other words, it warms your insides. That is also the technique in which that the monks use in order to melt snow around them as they are um, practicing that particular breath technique. Um, so even in the freezing cold, they can melt snow around them. Um, this is also the technique that they use in order to light up a light, you know, a light bulb also within their hands. So um, take advantage of what the brother is talking about and do your research. Yeah, that's actually what he said at the place. He was like, yeah, this is what monks use to, you know, heat up snow. And um, he, he showed us basically how to um, cultivate that energy into our three dancey ends. Uh, right. That one was called empty force. Mm-hmm. Well, what right. I refer to as empty retention, exactly, which is pranic breathing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So basically you're doing, it's kind of like the hugging the tree uh, pose, but you're not holding your hands in just one position. You're bringing that energy back uh, mm-hmm. as you're visualizing and bringing that energy back. And then there were, now this is just, Level one, but so far to me, this is the most effective as far as, you know, recharging your energy and all that, giving you energy. Um, there's, so you have empty force, right? Mm-hmm. Then you have what's called, which is very similar to the, uh, what's it called, lifting the sky, but this one is called um, cloud hands. And what you're doing is you're putting your hand in front of you like a cup, bringing it up to your face. As you exhale, you're expanding your hand up, and then it's going, and then kind of like an eagle, you know, I mean, you're letting your hands go gently back down. It's very similar to uh, carrying the moon, except, you know, I mean, not bending forward like that. Right. Then there was earth hands, which, I mean, you're inhaling, putting your hands, circling like about three times and going down. Now, earth hands, I mean, you're just generating an energy field around you. See, when he did it, I mean, he had a visualization up there. So, you know, like how you see in Dragon Ball? Right. You know, when they're shooting energy beams? He yeah. had that. <laughs> But going around his hand. So it was easier for people to, you know what I'm saying, visualize, at least. Right. Um, and then they have this one called carrying around the world, which is or, um, around the world, which you're moving on your central a- axis, and it's a palm face and palm connection. And what you're doing is you're moving from left to right. And you're feeling the energy, um, you know, balance, like you're holding a ball right in between your palms. Right. So once I went through all that, and then there's this other one called push hands. Now, 
push hands was one of the most profound that I've tried because you because when you start out you feel it's kind of weak, but once you begin you know doing it daily, you can feel almost as if like there's say a um an arm or a wave just pushing your hand to the other side and instead of you using your hand, you know you're feeling a wave to put your hand to the other side right right. All right, um, we're going to hold it right there. Um, it's the top of the hour, and I'm going to try to bring on Brother D. Brad. Um, hopefully he's here, and um, hold on, stay with us, um, Brother Mike, okay? No doubt. Greetings, peace. It is Brother D. Brad. Yes, sir. All right, all right. How are you, bro? We that was well, good, brother. man. I'm sitting here like... Can I listen to more? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to fix it on in, you know, because, um, you know, we we decoding um everything tonight. So um, we did the cartoons, the children cartoons, and um now we're getting ready to go into um the Django joint because, um you know, that's what people are on here ready to um listen to, to also. So um, we ready for you. What you what you got? What you what you felt from it? Well, well, first, I just real quick, I just want to say, I just did want to say that I actually I enjoyed that convo, and the main reason why is because I teach my little four year old breathing, which right. I started to help her not cry when she would fall and bust her behind somewhere, right. and, I, and I have recently started teaching her about her chi energy, so I was really like sitting there into that convo. But okay, now we, are, we now I got the opportunity. Now I was told, I was into it because I, I that's stuff that I teach my little four year old. Right. So no, I'm I listening. Say. I wish I could have taken notes. Oh, don't worry. We'll get back into it. Uh, no, peace, up? bro. I was going to say, oh, um, peace, yeah. It was funny because last night, right before I was falling asleep, I was watching an, a lean lecture, and then I see this guy talking on here about agents or some shit like that. And I, I, just, my, I just zoned out watching the whole thing, and then I found out, oh, that's who he's bringing on tonight? I was like, I never even ah. it <laughs> Excellent, excellent. It's all love. It's all love. Well, you know what, bro? I mean, the thing is, the, what well, my thought process is about, especially what is the pronunciation of that movie? Django? Yeah, Django. And please, you, you, you know, you're a person. When it comes to more science and so forth and so on, you're someone that I'll sit down and listen to. And everybody knows me. I'm hard headed I don't listen to many, but you're one. Now, please tell me if I'm way off base with this. When I watched it, I got the thought process of wow, like I remember look at the out look at the, the, the clothing he's wearing. With like when he first when the do you remember the beginning when, of the movie when Django was the German dude was like, Oh pick your clothes, he's like, You wanna leave some old clothes? And then he and then the, 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 the what he wore. Right. Was that it seemed to me, and again, if I'm wrong, then please let me know. But it appeared to me that his choice of clothing was very more inspired. Like, I swear I've seen paintings of of the Moors in Spain with the exact same outfit that he first wore with the, would look like the boat, like the big tie, and, and or am I, or am I completely, no, am I completely off base? No, you, you were definitely correct. And matter of fact, it was Masonic, too. Because he wrote right. the color okay. blue, in which that was symbolic to the Blue Lodge or the Blue House, which is the first three degrees, yeah. and to apprentice, fellow craftsman, and fellow um, master mason. You know, and the reason why I thought that was interesting is because, not just because of the color, but it showed him in his progression of becoming yes. free. And matter of fact, if you remember, yes. around that same time, the German gave him the last name Freeman. Freeman, yep. yeah, right. Yep. Yep. You know, Freeman. You know, so this is Django Freeman. You know, so it was right well, around that. You know, that was right around that same time. So symbolic to you know Freemasonry. You know what I'm saying? And the same. Exactly. And the reason why he, okay. Right. And the reason why he had on those particular colors of blue. You know, and that's what that was an interesting scene. You know, and that's what yeah. I felt. You know, and remember, he killed the three ruffians. Who was the first people that he yeah. killed? For sure, he killed uh, the. Um well, what you talking about? The German cat is the one who right. killed the dude right. that was bring that was carrying him. Right, right. Yeah, when right. he came in, 
Right. Because the first dude Django killed, Django killed, the first one he killed was, I believe, when he just shot them dudes on his own. Right. They was called unless, the, like, right. They was called the Three Brittle Brothers. Yeah, the Brittle Brothers, yes. Right, Brittle. You know, come on, when we think about Brittle, what that means? Something that breaks up real easily. Breaks it easily, yes. You know what I'm saying? But then they changed yeah. the name to Schaefer. Yep, <laughs> they you did. Know, they showed you, up there. You no, know, when the word Schaefer is actually is a German word also. Yep, it sure enough is. My you boy, know, while growing up, my best friend was German, and that was he had a a aunt who's from Germany. I met her, her last name was Schaefer. I remember that. So right. when I heard that name, I was just like, and so I'm watching it. Like uh, first of all, let me preface it by saying, I, I think based on the story that that uh, brown people in this country have been told about slavery, if they're going to believe that wholeheartedly. Anyone who doesn't like it has the right to say, I'm not going to see it because I don't want to deal with slavery. Or if they watch it and even if they want to sit there with their arms crossed, they have that right. So my whole d- discussion with the movie is not about whether or not a brown person should be upset or emotional about this. I just think that I haven't heard really rational discussions. It's either like I hated it and I didn't see it. Or I saw it and no matter what you tell me, I'm mad about the fact that those dogs mauled the slave. You know, it's kind of like, you know, it's it's either this or that to me. Because I know, for me, what caught my attention, what made me actually say, and I did not pay. I saw it online for free. So that's the irony. Like, I had people argue with me on Facebook and basically almost almost call me a sellout because I said, well, I wasn't mad at the joint, but yet you went and spent $50 and gave that white boy your money, and I saw it online for free. So at the end of the day, I'm like, who's really the fool here? You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't pay for that. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, Right. Once I saw that Reginald Hudlin was a producer, that's what made me go, okay, now, you know, let me go check this out. I had the right. opportunity to work with Reginald Hudlin, and Reginald Hudlin is saying for House Party, which I think, to me, growing up, was one of the best. That was my coolie high. It was. When I was growing up. House Mine Party. Too. Mine too. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then he did Boomerang. And I've always said, Boomerang, him and his brother, and I've always said, I would put Boomerang against any romantic comedy Hollywood throws out. I don't I even call do. Boomerang a black romantic comedy. You know? And then he was the exec producer of, of um, Boondocks. So I keep trying to tell these brown people that we got to stop being so myopic when it comes to Hollywood. It's like, it's almost as if you got, if you had the red cape on, brown America would look and go, well, he must be the one. It's like, nah, in film, the director has only a little bit more authority than the actor does, unless your name is even Quentin Tarantino. And I'm like, if you believe for one minute that Reginald Hudlin was not standing on his shoulder going, hey, do this, do that, nah, bro, you're going to get yourself in trouble if you do this, you're, you're tripping. You know, and, I, and, and what, I, what I saw a lot of it, like I said, you can break down the whole Moorish aspect, so at least you know that I was on that vibe. You feel what I'm no saying? Doubt. Like, when I was watching I was like, yo, like, y'all not seeing? But see, my thought process was when I looked at his hair and all the other things, I was like, I kind of guess, and you let me know again if you think I'm really too far off that he was that he got caught that he was a seaman, a more status wise, but he did something and got caught up because I'm like he didn't look like the rest of the slaves even physically. He had the lashes on his back, but I was looking at his hair and I was going, he it's like that Cedric Cedric Douglas thing he had going on. And then when the Germans found him, I said to myself, well. Normal slaves, you're not going to be able to find them like that. But if you were once a free person who got caught up in the mix and the people know, and there are those who know you got caught up in the mix, somebody can come and find you. That was what my thought process was, that if there was a prelude to that film, that you would have thought, oh, no, he was free. He just did something, broke law, whatever. You know how it was back then. You break the law, you're going, you're going to the plantation. You're, you're basically a slave. You know, So that was what my creative thought process was. But as I watched the film, you know, I've explained to people that who brown people who won't watch the film. I said, yo, to be honest with you, even Samuel L. Jackson's character, the house slave, that old man ran that plantation, and he was very witty and intelligent. There was nothing stuff and fetching about him. I was like, to be honest, his behavior to me was no different than the average African American is to another African American. If you're working in in the White House, you think that the the the, the African American uh, aide to the Secretary of State want to see another brown person walking that heck to the no? I've done. I listen. I tried to get a job at Target just part time in between my gigs, and I got interviewed by this brown this brother who looked at me like, "Snitter, please, I'm not hiring you." Why? Because he was the only brown dude in there, and he had a high position. I went through the entertainment industry, where you walk in and there's another brown person. They look at you like, 
What's that nigga doing on that nag? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'll be like, <laughs> you know, you walk through, like, you don't get in the big house too? So I'm like, yo, dog, I, honestly speaking, to me, that's what I saw on Samuel's character. And I and then I tried, and I was telling the cat, I said, and if you really peep the game at the end, I said, he was schooling Leonardo DiCaprio's character. I was like, remember, when he called to the library, Leonardo walking like a kid. My man was sitting there with his leg crawled for the cut with a glass of Devossier. You know, right. I said, even at the end, when he was when he was telling Jamie Foxx, and what really got me, what really bugged me out, was he told him, like, yeah, we could, you know, burn your pile of off. But after me, he said, now nah, we're going to send you to wherever uh, uh, mining system. He said, and they're going to make you bust big rocks down to little rocks for the rest of the days of your life. And I said, yo, that, he just told J- uh, Django that prison was worse than what he could have got from uh, than anything else he could go through. I'm like, did anybody keep that? He just told him, like, prison, because that's what it is. He was sending him to prison. You do what I'm saying? So I'm watching him. All his life. Yeah, I'm (laughs) great. So I'm watching it, and then I told the sisters, I'm like, yo, listen, I know, you know, like, because I watched it in the beginning with the screw face. I don't cut the white boy, no slack. I'm ready to bang on these crackers in their system. So I sat there for like 45 minutes with the screw face, but then after about an hour, I was like, honestly, I ain't been offended yet. Even the, the use of the word nigger, I was like, if you listen to how they were saying it, it was so over the top that it's yeah. like you don't see the comedy in that. Like, I was like, the, the only thing that people go, oh, you know, I don't want to, I guess it's, it's not entertainment to me to see a black man sleeve get torn apart by dogs. I keep telling people, nah, when it came to the, and again, you see to let me know if, I'm, if you think I'm far off. When it came to certain aspects, I said, yeah, you saw him raise the whip, but then you heard the crack. And you heard the squeal. Now, if they let your imagination take off with what would have happened, I said, but Jango was killing them crackers wholesale. I ain't right. seen a movie oh, yeah. like that this Blade. Blade right. was the last <laughs> superhero movie I've seen where some brother was just killing these crackers for wholesale. And, and Wesley had to do it under the guise of vampires. I said, I told my brother who was like, I don't want to say, I said, yo, ain't even a bullet grazed that man. I said, as a matter of fact, they're talking about the little scenes about the world when the Mandingas were fighting. I said, they still ain't really show nothing. But daughter, they ain't show every time that white boy got his head blown off. I said, I told my brother, as a matter of fact, in one of the fight scenes, they were shooting each other five or six times. Because he was picking up their body, sliding across the floor with it. And all you saw was him laying in between these white boys who were already shot up, getting shot up some more. I'm like, right. so all of it through this violence was directed at the slave owners and, and the people that work with them. I said they showed you how stupid they were, that scene with Don Johnson, who was Big Daddy, the whole KKK scene. Oh, you saw them all on the horse? Yeah. yeah. They were showing so many of the fallacies of the story of slavery we've been told in the United States of America. And I'm like, in reality, if you look at it with, a, with, with your open eyes, you would kind of start to question some of what we've been told. Because they're showing you like, yo, some of this is such a fallacy, it's almost improbable that you told me it happened. So right. for me, I walked away and said that if in America, not the Caribbean, but in America, if slavery went down the way they said it did, to either A, you're not telling me the truth, or B, you need to tell your scientific community to just start admitting that the black man is a Superman. Because there ain't nowhere in the world that anybody can go through that every day and still get up the next day and pick your cotton. My great-grandmother, who was 90 some years old when I was a little kid, from the age of 10 to 12, 10 to 13, I used to go there every summer. And she never taught me about slavery. She used to talk to me about how her mother used to have to pick cotton. And she lived on the same plantation. Then I thought, like, oh, you were sharecroppers. That's what she told me. And I went and tried to pick cotton. Healthy. That's hard. So you're telling me that you whip everybody all the time? Nah, I'd be someday rational about that. And that movie showed a lot of things that I'm like, can at least be questioned. About it, and I thought like, and they dealt with paperwork so much to the day. Just was hitting me upside the head, like yo, like they really, you know. I'm like, I don't. So that's what kind of got me when I watched it was that there were so many different things that they showed. I mean, they went to Candyland. I mean, they paid the whole homage to Kemet. I mean, the more what did they 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 zoomed in on the the doorknobs that I forget. I think they had I her on. And then the, that was like his favorite woman. Her name was Sheba. You never saw him slap her, disrespect her, but you dog she was, she was saw that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character be damn there and said she was with his sister. That's right. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? You saw that? Right. I was like, you, you saw at the end of that joint that how raw was it that since when you ever seen a film where the last victim killed is a white chick? He blew right. that bra's chest open. He sure with did. no remorse. Blew her back. With no remorse. 
Louis <laughs> Banks and, and, and told his sisters, <laughs> sisters and told his sisters, um, say goodbye to so and so and so. Say go ahead and Why? say goodbye. Um, goodbye. <laughs> yeah, with no with no remorse, and the no people remorse, that criticize uh, with Samuel Jackson's character, I'm like, yo, if he was a step in fashion, he was hard body because he stayed on that to the end. Right, he had you know, before a foreign guy when he said, "Oh Lord Jesus Christ, please let me kill this nigga." I said, "I'm laughing because okay. I said he gonna stay there to the end." I, I did too. <laughs> I did too. But see, this is the amazing part is that um, I actually counted how many times they used the word nigga in there. <laughs> how many times? It was ninety three times. <laughs> 93 times. And the reason why I had to count is because I know that there's also symbol symbolism behind, you mm. know, the reason why they had to use it that many times. Well, you know, of course, we know that the word, you know, nigga is derived actually from the word naga, you know, which means yes. god yes. or serpent deity or, you know, serpent god, you know, symbolic to your Kundalini, as we was talking about earlier, or me and Brother Mike was talking about earlier, the about dragon. Dragon Ball Z, right, how it symbolizes the dragon. Yep. Now, yep. What is happening that when you say the word, but see the word naga also means light, L I G H T. So whenever you saying it, it's it's ninety three, you know, times that's symbolic to the sun. The sun is the so called giver mm. of light of the world. You know what I'm saying? And it happens to be how many miles away from the earth? Ninety three million. Ninety three well, million miles. Well, the ninety third attribute of Allah is El Nur, which means the light. Mm. I was you know gonna, I, I was gonna say something, Malin. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, that's funny because I was born in 93. Right. Right. Wow, you were young in 93. Big <laughs> show, brother. I'm born in 72. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know what's beauty, but you know what's so beautiful to me about this? Because this ain't just me saying this. See, see right. I'm being mundane with what I'm saying. You're taking it and breaking it down to another level. That I'm like, you're exactly right. I'm being mundane with it. And 95% of people I run into ain't trying to hear it. They're like, oh, I'm, and I'm just like, nah, you got it a lot. I, you know, like I said, I understand the emotional aspect, but you can't just shut down because it's like you, you and I'm, listen, I ain't never getting a white boy credit for nothing. I'm giving it to Reginald Hedlund if I'm going to give somebody credit for something. Bump that. I don't care what nobody say. But I right. will say at the end of the day, there was so much going on in that film. Like, they showed that they, nobody was redeemable. And because I was told my brother, normally in a movie like that, there's one white guy. Number one, the one good white guy was German. So he wasn't even from this country. So they showed the relationship between Germans and the Moors. Right. Germans and so brown that, people. They showed well, see, that. They, hold on, hold on. There's, there's, there's a book called The Orientus in which that specifically speaks about how a Jew posed as a Moor to get out of Germany during World War II. And that was the only way he was able to get out of Germany was to put on a fez and to be a moor to get out. Yep. And so there's a book. And I don't know where I just heard that, but I just oh yeah, I just heard that. I, I think maybe I listened to your show last yesterday. I think y'all talked about that. When you had a ride. Right. I think I think y'all. But no, you're exactly right. You and um and I actually went and looked some of that stuff up afterwards, and I was like, wow, here it is, and this, that, and the other. And that's what people were missing. And then I told my brother, they didn't even let him be, have a redeemable quality because he tried to pull. The, it was interesting because the one time he had a redeemable quality when he stepped to Jamie Foxx, like, oh, you know, the way you treat the slaves. And Django was like, and this is from the same man who wanted who watched me shoot a, a father in front of his son. German said, yeah. point taken, <laughs> and walked away. So I said, they didn't even give him a redeemable quality. Right, he was right. to me, like, yo, like, y'all not even letting him redeem himself. And then, you know, the, I told the sisters, I said, listen, the only one time you saw nudity was when a baby girl was in, in, the, in the hot box, but it made sense. I said, they didn't show her being raped. They didn't really show her being beat. You saw her face, but you didn't see the, you know, I said, the most gratuitous violence again. I said the symbology again was all on them crackers. I was like, because the thing that I told, I, I told, I was talking about with someone who saw it, and they missed, and they had to go back and watch it online free. Like I gave them a joint with that. I was like, they show how gay these cats was. I said because remember when Zhanga was hanging upside down, that dude was finessing his balls. Right. And then what was crazy about it when Samuel Jackson's character came in? Did y'all see the way that he that white boy walked out of that out of the uh, barn? He was switching like his leg was wrist and he was switching like a mug. And I'm like, yo, like they're giving it to these crackers. Like, this has got to be a resident. Yeah, right, but thing check right this here. out. Guess who that was who was walking out the bar? That was the original oh. Jungo who played um Jungo back in nineteen eighty six and nineteen eighty seven with um Jungo no, on the no, Jungle. Right. You serious? Yeah, and that's why he asked him 
He said, do you know how to spell Django? And then, you know, Jay said, wow. yeah, D-J-A-N-G-O, and the D is silent. You know what I'm saying? And, wow. that's, and that's what he was and that's who he was talking to was the original John Go, you know what I'm saying, who played, you know what I'm saying? So it was like the mantle being turned, you know what I'm saying, or being, yeah. you know, passed on. You know? And so let, let me yeah. say this too about the another interesting scene. Um, like you said about, you know, um being fed to the dogs. You know what I'm saying? Like you said, people got, you know, real disturbed about that, but they didn't really yeah. so you heard the growling, you heard, you know, um, you seen, you know, a little portion of the dogs, you know, biting at the clothes and so forth, but they didn't get graphic with it. Like you say, the most graphic parts that they actually showed was the white folks getting their heads blown off, getting blown <laughs> back, getting, I mean, just, I mean, just getting crazy with it. And that was, you know. Now, I was just going to say. Oh, no. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, even though I, even I used to think I was white, but I never laughed so much at a movie where white folks was getting fucked up like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, especially not them. I mean, in that situation, it was because I had a, you know some some sense to get on me about Facebook about me saying I'm a Jordy. But I'm like, yo, you really mad because he's slave? Like, think about it. On one hand, you mad at the movie Django because all oh, the slavery. But then on the other hand, I start gloating and laughing, like telling you how because it was fun to me. I got a kick out of it. Like, yo, this is fun. And well, no, you had to why because um, Django symbolizes Shango from out of the Yoruba, in which that was an ancient comedic teacher, is Heru. And for yep. those who are in tune with the age of Heru, which is the age of Aquarius, wouldn't have a problem with understanding that science. And that was the real thing behind it. So, I mean, when you when you um, analyze Shango within the Yoruba traditions, he was the thunder god. That's where Thor originated from within the Norse. Of the Nordics um, yep. um, tells within the comic books, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And but and he was the he that. was the um he was the god of thunder and lightning. You know what I'm saying? And, so and, I mean, what they yep. what they what do they say? You know what I'm saying? What do they say about um 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 about guns? You know, when you shoot someone, you gun clapping, you clapping, yeah. hits yeah. thunder. They didn't used to call you know what I'm saying? And, and that's that what they were showing was the thunder. You know what I'm saying? From his and and they also remember them. The German also told him, he said, you know what they're going to call you, John Go? They're going to call you the fastest man in the in the South. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you they're going to call you the fastest gun in the South. Right. Yep. And so the South symbolizes, you know, um, where the Kundalini energy, that Naga energy, rise up from. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, this is I mean, this is all part of the um, same information. You know, and um, in the chat room, they were talking about um, also with John Go was whooping the white boy. You know, that, he, he was working <laughs> yep. on with a whip, you know what I'm saying? You know, and, mm-hmm. you know, when we look at that, you know, that also was the cracking of the back, hence the cracking or the, or the, um, or the thunder, mm. you know what I'm saying, or, yes, you know, yes. or the lightning strikes, you know what I'm saying, symbolic to yep. um, Django or Shango, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, they keep showing it over and over again throughout the movie, which is actually the rise of Heru. That's what that movie was actually about, the rise of Heru and, yeah. You know, and and the coming, you know, together once again with the feminine principle. In other words, yep. it was the time for man, you know, you know, so-called melanated beings, men in particular, to begin to start unifying, and for the black man to stand up, you know, the more to stand up and take back his rightful um, um, position, you know, what I'm saying, and unify with his woman and protect her. And you know what you write so right with that unification because it was all picturesque and symbolic because, like, I got into a chat. And Chas got really upset with me, I swear. And I was like, I, sometimes I get appalled with the things people will say online. It's like, you really going to say that, dog, over this white boy's movie? So I had to get off of it. But I was telling, I was speaking to him out because the dude was like, yeah, and Django, he didn't even free none of them slaves. I said, no. You're, they were free themselves. Then. She was, exactly, he was symbolic. I said, when he left, that door was open. And what that was symbolic to me, Thank that you. was. He, he didn't tell him to close that damn door back. <laughs> he told him to pass yeah. this damn dynamite. I'm getting ready to go back to Master's house and blow this shit up. <laughs> yeah, and that door was open, and I said, and just like just symbolic to what I feel of the the Negro pen, that door was open, and all three of them dudes sat there looking at each other. Right, <laughs> and, and, and I mean, I mean, and, and he told the women, he told the um, two sisters, you know, one was Sheba, like you said, so he didn't kill Sheba. Yep. You know, what I'm saying Sheba symbolized the queen Sheba, or what's in the ancient Egyptian text, Sheba becomes um 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 head Heru. You know what I'm saying? Or known as Hed Heshet. You know what I'm saying? And also, K 
Kerry Washington symbolized, oh, yeah, this is what one of the brothers, original Titan, is saying, too, in the chat room, that um, Kerry Washington symbolizes, oh, yeah, you know, the Orisha god or goddess, you know, you know, so, you know, their whole thing was, you know, based on, you know, that symbolism, you know, you know, of about Shango, you know, and that energy, you know, and if we go, yeah, as he, yeah. he says here in the room, he, matter of fact, he says symbolic for people today who's going yeah. to sit around and wait for someone to free them and who's going to operate in the energy of Shango. This is the question. This is what the brother says, original Titan. Um, so, See, it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, because the thing, the thing that I was going to say is, like, I listen to a lot of brothers when they do film breakdowns, so forth and so on, in the music, you know. And the one thing I do know is that I would tell a lot of the people that the reality is me from being there. Like, I'm still involved in the entertainment industry. You know what I'm saying? I just teach performing arts to the children. Like, you know, for whatever reason, I was able to take all this white boy's information and tell everybody and... I guess whatever I did on, on an esoteric level, they just can't touch me. It is what it is. But the thing about it is that I've, I've you know, I've went, people have to understand these directors and producers are aware of the same things we build about. I remember going, real quick story, I knew the casting director for the uh, for that movie Precious. And when it was called, whatever that movie, the original title of the, movie, the book was called. And she had me go in and audition. She taught me, that's what I bump it. I go in and I audition for the Lee Daniels, the guy who directed Precious. And I was auditioning. He wasn't paying me no mind. I was reading the lines or whatever. And then his assistant was like, well, have you seen Lee Daniels movies? And I was like, nah, yeah, you know, I saw Monsters Ball. And he was like, well, did you see Shadow Boxer? And I remember two days before me and as of I was on 125th Street and we were building about it. And he started breaking out the mind control aspect of it. So now the comedy is me being the jerk that I am. So I was like, yeah, I've seen it. So I, re- I regurgitated everything that Soraya said just to see what they were going to say. Dr. Ali Bay, you want to know what that, that Hollywood director's response was? What did he say? Can I tell you what it was? Yeah, please. Whoever he was talking to on the phone, he said, hold on a second. Put his hand over the, the phone. He said, hold on a second. Just stay right there. He got on the phone. phone he said, let me call you right back. He hung the phone, he stood up, he walked towards me. He said, what did you just say about my film? And I said, yo, man, I don't mean no disrespect, but, you know, from what I studied about doing, dealing with a cult and, you know, mind control, listening to me, it was about mind control sleepers, and that's the reason why. And he looked at me, he said, wow, you're exactly right. You're like one of the first people that came to me and actually said what I was doing with that film. Wow. And sat down. And they said, you coming in. Now, of course, they didn't call me back for that all this, for the role. Right. But so it's like these people are into this, and that's why when I saw originally if it was straight Quentin Tarantino, I would have never went to see it because he basically he quote unquote pays homage to films like people love Kill Bill, and I'm like, dog, I had the original. He did nothing but put the Game of Death outfit on that white girl, and just I mean I'm talking frame by frame the music and everything. He stripped straight from that movie that they there was it's a Japanese movie. I forget the original name of it, but I have it somewhere in my house because I've showed it to people. Because the part where Uma Thurman is fighting in the snow, the original version, the woman is naked because she was in a hot tub and she's fighting in the snow naked with them dudes. But um, but that's why when I started seeing, when I saw Reginald, I said I need to watch it because I'm like I want to see what he's going to do because that's you know I've, I've said to people as a filmmaker, him and Robert Townsend are like they're like you know every to me in my world as filmmakers when it comes to quote unquote black. Cinema, I'm looking at them like you're the greatest. Hollywood stuff for me is one of the greatest films ever. That's why Robert Townsend ain't working right now because he, he prophesied what was going to happen if anyone's ever seen Hollywood Shuffle. And I've already said about Reginald, so then I saw it immediately. All of Reginald Hubbard's symbolism was just pop like ping, 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 ping. And I'm looking at this joint like, yo, y'all ain't seeing this? Y'all mad at this movie? Put it you like this. With all due respect to everyone who doesn't like it, I, if I'm going to have my daughter watch a, a fictional slave narrative, I will have her watch it. Django Unchained way before Roots. No doubt. I don't even want her to see Roots. I want no to see Django Unchained. I told all them sisters. That man got, like, on one hand, y'all mad because the black woman always made it look a certain way. This man went through hell and high water, and the German told him that Norse story about the dude, the guy who tried to get his woman, and he had to go right. to hell. Boom, and, and I'm like, y'all. Yeah, Broom Hilda. And I'm like, y'all can't even see what happened. That man went through hell to get his woman. But no, yeah. oh, you just concerned because they said nigga 90 times? Okay. 
<laughs> you don't know what you got to do with that. Like, what? I, what okay, nobody said nigger. All right, fine. You, you know what I'm mean, saying? I mean, what can I do? Well, at that point, it's no discussion because the masses are caught up on to use of the word nigger. And, of course, then they'll go turn that off and turn the radio on and listen to Trinidad James or whoever else, whatever else hot song where they're saying nigga in the most defiling way. So it was like, it was very interesting to me what has happened with this movie Django and Chain. But I looked at it and said, wow, like, you know, I hope I'm not wrong about when I'm looking at this Moore's connection, but it just seemed to me that this dude, you know, he just saying I'm not a slave. He just right. said that right. was in the very beginning. Right, he said, he said didn't, didn't the white man tell you that um, I'm not a slave? And she said, yeah. Yeah, for real? You ain't no slave? Now, think about it. Now, at the end of the movie, now when he, right before he's getting ready to kill off the rest of the white folks, I what did he say? Guns. He said, man, I didn't know I looked so good in burgundy. Now, what oh, color is the What's the color of the Please explain us to that, burgundy. Right, thank you. So, um, <laughs> they, they, they was putting the Moorish element into it. Yes. You know? Yes. Like, I looked at Samuel L. Go ahead. Oh, what's going on? No, I was going to say, did you no. see that movie, uh, The Man with the Iron Fist? Oh, I watched it because my man from WWE, Batista, was in it. It was all right. I saw it, though. What did you think about that one? Uh, you know, I, like I said, I, I watched WWE wrestling, so Batista was in it, so I turned it. Hey, you know, I didn't. I, I don't like. I'm not. A, I'm not a dude that sits around and watches movies to analyze them because I'm like so arrogant towards this white boy system that I ain't going to you for no answers, white boy, nigger. <laughs> I'm not going to you for no answers. Like it, to me, that was always kind of crazy, a crazy concept. Like you're my enemy, but I'm going to watch your programming to see what you're going to impart on me. Nah, I'm cool. So I don't even go to movies. Like, my daughter's aunt, godmother, is a working actress. I don't see her. So I don't sit and watch her stuff. I have no clue what day her show comes on television. I don't know. I just know it's on, and I know that's a godmother. But, you know, I don't go to movies because, again, that just seems kind of like, I don't know. Again, I may be tripping, but I'm so arrogant towards this system. That I'm like, I'm not coming to you. I'm not going to debate Dr. Eileen Bay with a book published by Westing, Westing Publishing House. That's his shit. You feel what I'm saying? Like, let me, I'm at a debate. Dr. Ali Bay with a Brother Polite book. Let me get one of Brother Polite's books. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? But I'm not, so that's how I have with movies. Like, though, I don't be looking. It's just that with that film, because I had a personal connection with Reginald Hudlin. I used to, um, one of my ex-girlfriends was best friends with Carrie Washington when she first started out acting. I went to the Negro Ensemble Company, the same school as Sam Jackson. He actually came back and watched a performance that I was in. So because of that personal connection, and I was kind of like, you know what, let me go see this story, right? Let me sit and understand, again, I reiterate, I watched it on ZMovie.net for free. I didn't pay dimes to that white boy to see this film. And I guess if I did pay, I probably would have didn't sound everything offensive because I just spent $30, $40 because I'm on a date going to see this movie, sitting in the uh, mind control chamber called a, a movie theater. So yeah, that's right. my take on it. You know what I'm saying? Mean, that's, that's, you, do you feel RZA, I mean – is playing that same game, you know, like I know you said uh, in one of your lectures, like agents. That's no secret, bro. With all due respect to RZA, there ain't no secret out there. Everybody everybody in this circle knows RZA tap dancing for them Jews. But it is what it is. I mean, what does I mean? That, honestly, to be honest with you, that's part of the game. That's why when I came back, I got me a business partner. See, he know how to play that game. I don't know how to play that game, and everybody that around knows I don't. So I'm the dude to just come in, and he'll come in, he'll wear the suit, and talk that talk, and I'll sit there. And then when I get to set, I do what I do. But every that's just part of the routine. You got you want to do, you know. And on top of that, I think what a lot of us have to understand too, and maybe Dr. Eileen Bay uh, uh, may see uh, a certain significance, is that like for those of us of like Riz is between 40 and 50 years of age, that generation and my generation and above. With all due respect, they kind of always wanted acceptance. It was a hip hop generation that came through and was like, "Yo, I don't care. I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do." But that, but Riz is like almost my brother's age, or in that almost fifty age range. Same thing with Jay Z. So it's like you look at them. It's like you got to remember their generation. Again, Dr. Ali, but you let me know if I'm too far off base. They wanted hugs and acceptance. So, of course, RZA, is, if he gets the opportunity, he's bragging about hanging with Russell Crowe. He's bragging about being around these white people. Same thing with Jay-Z. 
because his generation, Jay's like 45, 46, his generation, they was like, yo, I just want to be accepted. So a lot of them, a lot of these, these brown people that get into these positions, that's what we have to remember. It was the same thing when Barack Obama was elected in office. I thought it kind of threw a monkey wrench into the conscious community because we had elders who were now at a crossroads because you, of that age, have been seeing civil rights and kind of sort of, you know, you're young and it would have been cool to see a black president. But now you have certain knowledge and you know better, but it's still kind of cool to see a black president. So now you're stuck. What you going to talk about? You see what I'm saying? So it's like right. it, it appeared to me that that's where – there was like a certain bit of divide. So I'm, you know, I, I grew up, you know, always looking at white people like, wow, you're great. For me, I was fortunate that I had a white best friend. I was in his home and I saw just like Samuel L. Jackson's character said, these are some people that ain't never had an intelligent thought in their whole damn lives. So for me growing up, I was like, I'm not impressed. You see what I'm saying? Like I would be around his family like, oh, did y'all do that? That's stupid. You know what I'm saying? So that's so I was never impressed. I was just always like, all right, it is what it is. But someone like RZA, he comes from that generation yeah, he's going to shut his job and do that tap dance and, you know, and let me, can I get, you know what I'm saying? It's what it is. But it's like, what you going to do? Same right. thing with Jay-Z. I can't be bad at jay Dog. Hey, man, you, you always look up to that white boy. Not to mention, if you ask my humble opinion, you are, you're an illegitimate offspring of the rock shows. But anyway, you know, that's another start for another day. So, isn't that something? I, I'm not mad at Rizzi. Say that again? Say, isn't that something? Yeah. <laughs> Which is my the, off, you know, the illegitimate child of a Rothschild, and the reason why he ends up using it, you know, yeah. Yeah, think about it. Think about it. My man Cameron, right, he had this album called Sex, Drugs, and Entertainment, and he had a makeshift NBA logo. They sued the hell out of that dude. Oh, he's not putting that up there. But now some dude can have a, a record label called Rocker Seller? And come out talking about drugs and hustling, and you know, nobody ever from the Rothschild go, wait a second, what the heck is going on here? We don't want to be associated with this, really? And I'm looking at people like, ain't nobody ever repeated that before? If yeah. you look at Jay Z, the older he gets, you look like an old Jewish man. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm serious, I'm just real. Will Smith just looks like he's having a life sucked out of him, but Jay Z looks like an old Jewish dude. The older he gets, he gets that little chin and all that, and it's just that the broad lips and the broad nose throw people off. I'm like, look at the dude. He looks like an old Jewish guy. And again, really, Rockefeller, I can use your name to say, well, I bet you give me another quote-unquote Illuminati name, and I guarantee you I cannot be walking around this joint calling my group the George W. Bushes, and we're talking about hustling and busting guns. Guarantee I couldn't do it. Right but Jay-Z can do the Rockefeller. All I'm saying is look into it, and he's of use. You know, he's okay. a beauty. I ain't mad at him. I, I like him. Rap City, I've seen a lot, too. That's another thing people don't understand about me. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot. You know what I'm saying? I've been fortunate. I've been behind. I've stood next to the Wizards of Oz, like behind the curtain, the little scraggly, weak Wizards who everyone's scared of. I've stood there and been like, wow, you're doing that. And they actually believe it. I don't Wait, can you tell me, they, um, supposedly, I don't know, like one of the Munchkins killed themselves on set or something. Is that supposedly true? I looked at the scene, and you do see some guy hanging, so I think it really happened. Because mm-hmm. I was into that like five years ago. I was into Frank's old bomb real heavy, <laughs> and I actually looked yeah. all it up. But, you know, so it's like I've been fortunate, like how it compares to the industry and what's going on. It's like, nah, um, this really goes on. Like, I've been on sets, and that's why I used to um, – I remember one time Professor Griff – had issues with this dude, and I don't want to blow the dude's name up because we don't have no drama, but he had issues with some guy that called him out on something that said Griff was doing something else homosexual. This is a dude that has, and he's known, and Griff was ready to go to war. And I, you know, and I normally mind my business, but knowing TV is something like I do, Griff is, is, an, is an artist, so he's not really privy to behind, behind, behind the scenes. You dig what I'm saying? So it was like if he came to Rap City, Professor Griff ain't telling me what he he ain't telling me nothing. I'm walking on set. I'm like, Yo, Griff, this is what we doing. You understand? When I was on Rap City, I stayed putting subliminal messages in my shows. If me and Eileen Bay knew each other back then, I'd have called Eileen like, Oh, we got Rock Kim, your favorite rapper. Yo, I'm gonna spell your name out throughout the show. I used to do it all the time. So I know this goes on. I used to do it all the time. So with this dude that he was beefing about, the guy had all these pictures. So I called Griff and said, Look, man, before you jump out the window, wait a second. Think about it. Who in their right mind in this day and age has the time to sit down, look at a Rihanna video, and go, right there is the Rain Man. 
and then here, you see. No, I was like, yo, I said, first of all, I've worked on sets with some of the biggest field directors, dog. I know for a fact that that's a lighting thing, baby. So if someone can sit there and tell you this, that, and the other, you need to ask, my man, where are you getting all this information from? Where are you getting it from? Like, stuff that this dude we breaking down is like, this is stuff that the only person would know if they're, if they're working set design, if they're doing if they're doing the storyboard. There's a whole lot of facets that go to these projects. And I told Griff, before you get on this dude, ask yourself, why would he know this information? That's some agent shit. So we had a lot of dudes on some agents coming in the game talking. I was just listening, be like, yo, how you know that, son? And I would ask them, and they would never have an answer for me. Because I can tell you, I've been on sets. You know, I can show you my time. I can show, but I've never seen none of these dudes on set. So I'm like, who's giving you this information? How are you making money, homie? Because this is, the editing is a very tedious process. And just because you misspell their T H I E R E I R or whatever it's spelled with T H E R, that's an obvious stupid mistake. That's a mistake for the song would think that you're some novice. But anybody that really is into the game knows like you did that on purpose. So, you know, a lot of these cats would talk about this stuff, and it's like, nah, it was coming from the industry. They were being commissioned, like, yo, here, you go talk this because it throws everybody else off. And, you know, and so, the, you know, it's, it's the, the entertainment industry is very deep, and, and people need to really kind of sort of, instead of looking at it for entertainment, understand how you have a country that's in a recession, but every year you got 20 Hollywood films being produced at a minimum of, like, $50, $60 million, but we're in a recession? We closing businesses down, but we just had a hundred million dollar movie made. Spider Man just came out, and that was made a year ago. And that movie cost about a hundred million to make. Well, shoot, take some of the Hollywood money and put it into the economy. But they won't do that. You'll be broke, but you'll be entertained. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's the same thing with films like Django. That's why I didn't want to give it the time of day in the beginning until I saw black people, brown people. So I'm, I'm teaching myself not to call brown people black anymore. So I saw them all up in arms. No doubt. Okay. Matter of fact, um, my man, Original Titan, in the back, he um, goes Uh-oh. in and he said, don't forget about the slavers trying to punish Broomhilda by burning her by her eye. You know, matter of oh, fact, please, Jamie Fox had, that. matter of fact, remember, she had the mark on her, near her right eye, and Jamie had the mark near his left oh, eye. Left eye. To yes. Hudi and Hiru. Now, it says, I think that the symbolism on how the powers to be or trying to shut down and calcify the third eye. That's what he goes into because he said the third eye also is the color of burgundy. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Now, now mm. the letter that they use is Ra. Uh, but yet the R sound is the letter Ra or the um, letter R in which that is on the eye. Somebody to supposedly um, who their quote-unquote um, master was, you know what I'm saying? But the R um, also symbolizes you know, raw, you know, and the fact yes. of, um, yes. you know, um, you know, that, that connection of the third eye and raw is substantial, you know, because, you know, it's the all-seeing eye, and the all-seeing eye is the symbol of raw, you know, as, you know, those who study um, Egyptology or Kemetology knows, you know. So, you know, I wanted to get back to that <laughs> right quick, you know, as we was, you know, no, as going through point. these movies, and I would like to um, go to the phone lines right quick, too. Yes. Um, let's go here. We have area code five four zero. Area code five four zero. You on the line? Peace. Peace. Five four zero. Area code five four zero. You on the line? All right, we're going to go to area code 708. Area code 708, you're on the line. 708. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Peace. Oh, good, hey. good. What's good, bro? Calling from Chicago, man, and literally I was talking to my homegirl today. We was breaking it down, and one of the things... <clears throat> we was talking about was like in the beginning scene how like during like frat rituals how they was walking the slaves in right mm. and then dude got his freedom and he let them go right um but then so, again so that's amazing so they come in with the scene more mm. behind each other um like mm-hmm. the greeks right right 
Exactly. Check it out. Another thing, too, we was talking about how, okay, I didn't know this originally, but Hollywood is referred to as Candyland. Right. So <laughs> yeah. when, my girl, when my girl was breaking it down to me, she was making references like, ah, okay, if you if you go through all the actors and break them down on a Zodiac level, using like the, the cosmophysics, astrology, the Saturn, which governs the part of the uh, the mouth or the teeth, which is due, um, what's his name, Christoph Waltz. Mm-hmm. But also Saturn's color is gray, which is also a Masonic, like a, a, a Masonic color as well. Right, so and, it, and, really... Mr. and Dr. Schultz, in which that, you uh-huh. know, um, um, he wore gray throughout the whole movie. Exactly. You know, Dr. Oh, my God, he did. If you, right, if you look at his birth date, his birth date is important because he's a Libra. And what was he speaking throughout the whole movie? He was speaking legalese. He was always right. talking about, you know what I'm saying, technicalities and et cetera, et cetera, as far as right, the law, blah, blah, blah. Right, justice, right. And how he was working for, the, you know, as the lawman, right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing, when they was riding through the... Uh, Remember the very first scene when he was like, "It's a nigga on the horse." Right. Did you see yeah, the who that goat? Nigga the, who that nigga on the nag? <laughs> but did you see the goats walk in front of the in front of them too? Yeah. Remember, sure you did. know the goat right. is, a, is a masonic is a masonic. Right. What's you call it? Right, right in the goat. Dude, exactly. Exactly. When, right when in the goat. Shot, um, when he shot Big Daddy, and this is what my homegirl said. She was like, "Ah, that makes sense." When he shot Big Daddy, Daddy, what did he say? He said, "The kid is a natural. Kid is a right. baby goat. Kid is a baby goat." Right. Uh, but see, that goes back so, to what I was saying about um, Jamie picking out for the first time his own clothes, and he picks out the color blue, in which that you blue. know, um, in which that yep. is the first th- three degrees of Freemasonry. You know, the enter apprentice, the fellow craftsman, and the master mason. You know what I'm saying? And um, you see him with that blue on, you know. But you know, like you said, he get ushered in as a Greek. Then by the time he picks his clothes out, he becomes a um, a um, Mason, a Freemason, hence he gathered the name Freeman at the end of his name, John Go Freeman, mm-hmm. and then by the end of the movie, he said, I look good in Burgundy, hence becomes a Moor. Right, so like at the end the of the movie. Mm. You know what I'm saying? From the mentality that we're going to have to make from the Greek to Masonry to Moor. Right. Like mm. at the end of the movie, he was like, uh, he was like, man, I didn't even know Burgundy was my color. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> he should have said that too. He should have said it. But then we'll show me because I watched it again today for like the fourth time. Sam Jack at the end was like, "What you think? You can't never burn down Candyland. We been we yep. here. We always gonna be here. It ain't <laughs> never going nowhere." <laughs> right. And I was like, "Wow!" But then what did he do? He burned it up. He burned that. Shit. But but remember, oh, remember, the um, the, remember the song. Remember the song by um by P. E. Um, and, um, and Ice Cube, it was called Burn, Hollywood Burn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. played it like three weeks ago on the, uh, the beginning of your uh, show. That's right. And I'm going to play it again when we close out tonight. But here, here's my question. I want to know if anybody can answer this. Remember right. when Django had the mask on, when you first seen him with the iron mask, and he was like, man, we don't, we don't want no niggas with sand. He said, like, you got a lot of sand, Django. We don't like niggas with sand. What does that mean? I know it right. means something. Right. Oh. Right. But I, we trying to figure that out. The sand part. Well, that's the reference once again to sand in my eye. Is an eye reference. Ah. Oh. Right. The Sandman go to sleep. You know what I'm saying? They don't want no. Oh, they want a consciousness. Yeah. Right. Right. So basically, what they was talking about was the different states of consciousness. That's what they was talking about, oh. with the different states. Of and that's why they kept telling him throughout the movie, you ain't like no regular slave or whatever, because right. everyone kept acknowledging, like, your, your level. And you could almost see with the, that's what I was saying in the beginning with Django, John, whatever his name is, that it was almost like they illuminated him to a certain extent over everybody else. So even when he was in line with the rest of the slaves, immediately you just drew right to him. And everybody, and they kept acknowledging that. That was, that was a good pickup, too, with the, uh, the sand in, my, in your eye joint. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, what was very, very key to me was, like y'all said it, they opened the case for these cats, and them cats stayed <laughs> right there. 
they ain't even move. I didn't even see the ending part till I had the, the privy of having it in my hand and watched it. And I watched, finally watched it today, and I was like, wow, they even put that in the end that we going to open the door for y'all, and y'all still ain't going to move. Y'all going to sit there and be content. Right. And, and, that's, you know, that's, fine, though. and that's the thing in which that is going on, you know what I'm saying, right now, you know, is the fact that the malls are opening up, you know, um, these different venues, and the masses aren't coming. They aren't coming. But you know what they, I got they, out they of that too, like, They're just like the slaves, like you said, sitting there want, wanting to be caged up. Wanting to be caged but, but up. You, but leaving the door but open. But you know what I got out of that? Loopholes. Go ahead. But there was one thing, though, that they did do that is, is correct with everything you guys are saying about that. Remember, though, I think, to me, I took it as that they were saying that there symbolically there was one person in that drug that was a symbol of hope. Because remember that one slave that just kept eyeballing Django right, and right. he had to go off on him? He was That's the right. same slave at the end that was admiring him, like, okay, That's so right. in a sense you could take it like that. But also, right. you could also take that in the sense of them of it being said, like, but eventually <laughs> the people are going to notice who you are and be like, okay. Because right. I guarantee you he got out that joint later on and got busy. So no it was almost like exactly what you're saying, but at the same time there was three of them, and one out of every three is going to go, okay, I see what right. you're about. Right. He's going to get it, fact, and that's kind of what I got. Right, and and to me he symbolized like um like um the Nat Turner, you know the smile, the little smirk that he gave him, you know as yeah. um, Jamie you know jumped on the horse and was riding back to the um plantation you know, to get his woman, you know what I'm saying? He you know he had a, like a little smirk on his face like yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and the, and that would this in like a conversation like this is all I really would ever ask brown people who feel a certain sort of way. It's like, you know, I understand it. I have the empathy for it. You have the right to. But just listen to those of us who have watched the movie. And then go see it yourself. Well, I'll give you the, the joints. You can watch it for free. And then just have dialogue. But it's like, it seems to me that in, that upon the masses, it's either this or that. There is no in between. I can feel you on that, too. To I was, I'm not yeah, no, that, with them, but I could... I can feel you on that too because I'm a I'm an avid movie watcher and I feel you. There's one particular movie theater I go to because I get the hookup with the passes. I'm always going. My movie of the year that hit me the hardest that I love was Looper. Right, the Django was very good though. It was very entertaining. I seen the symbolism behind it. I relate just like you did on the fact that we ain't seen no brother go hard on 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 Whitey like this. And at the end of the day, walk victorious with the girl. We ain't seen that in a long time. Yeah, Blade but never had I, a girl, so he never got the girl. So <laughs> right, so, so Blade. Right. Blade was the last thing. That right, was like right, that. right, right. So, so this is a step up. You know what I'm saying? You know, uh, uh, at least you know the brother um, walked away with the girl whose last name is Washington, symbolic to Washington. You see what I'm saying? Ooh. So I don't oh, think that. Wow. I don't. I didn't I don't, pick I don't that up. Yeah, because I think that's why she was picked in that particular role of cast because it's somebody like to Washington. You know what I'm saying? Because her last name is Washington, and anyone knows that the emperor's been telling us for you know forty, you know, going on fifty some odd years that the names of the indigenous people was changed from Washington from Washington to Washington. Wow, and you know what's interesting about that? Why you're so correct, Rob? Because I'm gonna tell you, and I've said it, I've been saying it for five, six years. Where I, I got number love for Carrie, but I'm telling you, Doctor Eileen Bay, when I was dating her best friend, I would see this average bra, and there was nothing special about Carrie. I was there when she, when we went to, we was in Brooklyn outside. I forget the School of Arts to prepare her first film, um, Love, an Hour Song, and I watched the perform, and I was kind of like, eh, and I'm thinking like, she sucks. Then I remember she first got her first role in that dance movie, and I'm looking at the movie like, eh, you're not from the streets. And so I kept saying to myself, Carrie, what the heck did you do in deep in Hollywood? Because they're giving you every, like, any poignant role when they, where they need a, 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 the, the woman. I'm looking at Carrie like, and I'm like, yo, either I'm cold, completely blind when it comes to talent, which I don't think I am, or, or shorty got to whatever it was that she needed to do. Carrie did it. Carrie did whatever they wanted to do because I'm looking at somebody say something well. about scandal because scandal is so heavy. It's like even I can't wait to see scandal the episodes because it's like man, if they they dropping it heavy in scandal. Mm. They right. dropped scandal heavy make it good? in scandal. Yeah, good. As a matter of fact, um, she she's the she has the lead role in the um in the TV show Scandals. That's what the brothers yes, talking about. Yeah. And right. it takes it's, place yeah, in Washington yeah. as well. Mm. Wow. But see, With her name being last name Washington. Right. 
But, you know, again, real quick, Dr. Ali and Baby, I'll be saying, now the dude that plays opposite her, Laz Alonso, that's my man. We used to sit around in, in our early days when we was in that same class. It's just that, you know, he would always talk about he's going to get to Hollywood, and I'd be like, I'm going to be directing. And we used to sit every morning in this daydream, but we just had to take two separate walks. Right. <laughs> you know like, and so, again, I'm looking at some of my, the cast that was in my class, and I'm like, yo, like, y'all are doing it. On one level, I'm proud of you. But on another level, I'm looking and going, like, okay, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's interesting what's going on here. And, and you know, and that, and that joint is very interesting. When I saw Laz was in it, I was like, well, maybe I'll check it out one day. But, you know, I think at some point, though, we have to kind of sort of get moved past. Uh, I just like I just have a thing with the entertainment industry. You know, right. I just did because it's like, it, because we become dependent upon it, or dependent on it. Like, right. it's cool to have these convos, and, and, and Django, the only reason why I stepped out of my realm, because, you know, brother, you ain't never heard me break down a movie before, even get involved in a joint, because I'm not into it. Like, yo, I'm not. But that movie, to me, caused such controversy amongst brown people. I'm just kind of tired of it. It's almost like the white boy can come in the black community and go, digga, digga, doll, and then, you know, we'll start arguing with each other over it. And it's like, well, why am I arguing with you over this cracker? Like, that's right. his movie that he made. Like, I'm not going to sit here and disagree with you all. You don't like it. I liked it. But at some point, it's like, can we just, just like the brother said, just, can we just listen? Because right. obviously all of us here, you know, are seeing something. So are we the crazy ones? I don't think that we are. Right. And I'm pretty sure if we had this convo, Quentin, Reginald, and every executive Hollywood producer would sit there going, these guys are correct. Now, I'm interested to see what Reginald and Quentin are going to be able to do after this. Because it's true right. to make this. But I remember, what I, like I said about Wesley Snipes and Blade, in my humble opinion, that's what got him in trouble. Not him trying to evade taxes. It's just that those money lenders, when he did the first Blade, they, all they see is money. They gave him the money without realizing what he was doing. And then they came back and looked at the third one. When he started dealing with mythology, and said, wait a minute. He done killed every white right person and saved the black baby and then killed 20 white people. Even in the last one, I tell people in the very beginning, Blade Stone Cold killed a white boy. That white boy said, I'm not even a vampire. Blade was like, so what? And stabbed him and shot him and killed him and walked off. And I'm like, and I, in my humble opinion, that's what got Wesley in trouble with the powers that be. Because they said, this nigga done put out three movies where he don't keep killing white people wholesale under the guise of being a vampire. And, right. and, and I'm interested to see, you know, what's going to happen with Reginald and Quentin Tarantino? Because I don't think those in power wanted it to be like this. Right. I don't think they wanted it to be like this. I guarantee you, when they saw it, it was like, because they hyped it up so much that you couldn't take that film and go, now nah, we got to do re-edits, because it was throwing you six, eight months behind from when you needed to release it. So they give them the film, the execs go sit in the, and watch the dailies, and are like, yo, what the hell is this shit? Right. Well, we, well, so we, we, the this. reason why we say that that was symbolic, um, Jungo is Shungo, which is his rule, is because... They did it on Jesus' birthday, December the twenty fifth, yes. when they released it. Oh yeah. So we know yeah, the correlation right. between that. That's when. That's when, like I said earlier, is when the sun comes and rises from out of the tomb. That's just like Harry Abiff and Masonry being resurrected at a ninety degree perpendicular level. That's what that is all symbolic to, and that's the yes, symbolic sir. to the resurrection. You know what I'm saying? The sun, solar energy being resurrected, as well as also the black man, who's you know the brown or you no know, more, being symbolic to um, him also resurrecting and coming back into his own. And that's what, and everybody knows that uh, um, the indigenous people around the planet have been saying this for years now, that we are going um, into a um, higher dimension. In other words, we are going to ascend, and it's going to be during the age of Aquarius. And it's going to be during the time when um, a galactical alignment is going to take place. The Mayans said it. The Omex said it. The Dogon said it. The Aborigines from out of um, Australia said it. Africans been saying it for um, eons. So, I mean, you know, you go to um, Kuda Mutua, you know, um, he, um, he is. Kuda Mutua, yes. Right. So, yes. I mean, you know, we can, you know, we know that, you know, that this whole thing is based on that. Now, now I do have to speak about what, what are the political ramifications of it, though. Like what you were talking yes. about, that's what, I know that's what you was getting at, you know, and the political ramifications, as we were saying, you know, about with Blade and Wesley Snipes, and like you said, with Reginald Hutland, um, um, and maybe with, um, you know, um, with um, the guy, you know, on the um, the writer, you know. Um, yeah, the white boy. Yeah, what's his name? Tarantino. Yeah, Tarantino. Tarantino. Yeah, Quentin Tarantino. You know, what might happen, you know, after now, you know what I'm saying? You know, but the thing is, is that, even Minister Farrakhan spoke about this, you know, last week about 
um, the, under the guise of also creating a race war or civil war in this country and that movie being utilized in order to create that. Mm. Because what it does is create the fear within white folks is that we're going to do to yep. them, you know, what they have done to us in history. And so, therefore, you know, that's the reason why they even put together white supremacy is to try to indoctrinate us and, you know, mind control us through subliminal, subliminal messages and even overt, you know, not just overt, but overt, you know. And so, you know, it's all tied in is that, you know, if this society's uh, money uh, finances collapse, you know, and people can't find food, you know, and we know that, you know, these are some of the things in which that might take place. I know a brother who told me that um, – he was getting ready to get strung up by the Klan, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. you know, and he told him, you know, that he was a Moor. And the Klan, you know, and the Klansman, you know, yelled back at the other um, Klansman and told him, said, yo, he's not a nigga, he's a Moor. Put him down, release him. Now, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. And, and now, 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 this brother is 88 um, years old and has no reason to lie to me, you know, about, you know, about it. You know what I'm saying? He's 88 years old. You know, um, matter of fact, he um, rose all the time. You know, he rolled with um, Romani Amanu Il, who wrote the book Negro Black the Moor. You know, and mm. so, you know, we need to, you know, definitely analyze what, you know, what they're talking about, you know, because there's still a connection, you know, in which that we haven't, you know, quite mastered yet. And that's still between Moors and Freemasonry, you know, and there's something going on, you know, because we don't have too many instances of the um, European or Albion walking up to, um, the brothers saying that they're glad that we're re- um, that we are waking up, you know, and that they are, yeah. you know, and so this awakening is part of that, you know, part of that same scenario, you know, what I'm saying. But we have to make sure that we know on um, what side that we're on if we want to stay Negro, Black, and colored, or if we're going to um, make that transition, you know, and that, um, that's why I'm saying you know, myself stop saying black. Right. And well, and also put forth, you know, like what um, Jamie, you know, like they was talking about, like you said, they talked an awful lot about paperwork in that movie. Yes. You know, what is known as freedom papers. They kept saying freedom papers over and over again. So it's no coincidence that, you know, for the people who do uh, reclamations and nationality, that people often call and say that they want their freedom papers. Now, you know, know what's interesting about all that, what you just pointed out? Is that in actuality, and we just forgot that we all got to talk about it. They made that a central part of a major scene. Remember, right. like remember when he told John that story about, oh, you know, so and so for thirty years, five five times a week for thirty years, such and such would shave my daddy with a straight razor. Right. And I always wondered why he just didn't show. Him. Yep. And so you feel what I'm saying? So they actually put that in that joint. Like, think about it. Right. They didn't make it in passing. That was a scene where you're sitting there stuck in. It's like, yeah, like, why don't they kill him? And then right. you give it to that part of the brain joint. But they gave him the close up, the, the medium shot, and everything for that scene. That's why I knew that the brain thing wasn't really, that wasn't about the brain scene because it was a wide shot. But when he right. was talking about, I always wonder why y'all never would just kill us, they gave him a medium shot or a close up. Right. And I was just thinking, like, wow, like, I wanted anybody in that there to get that. Now, my homeboy said, when he went, he said, that scene, them crackers was quiet in the mug in that there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he said, them crackers in that there was quiet in the box. Like, he said, he was looking around, it was just him, like, they were other black people. He said, right. well, well, you know what? Games, well, that, that goes back to the scene, you know, that goes back to the scene with the KKK, you know, with the beginning stages of the KKK. And Don Johnson, you know, playing Big Daddy. <laughs> You know, and of course, you know, in that particular role, I think that he um, actually was symbolically playing Albert um, Pike. You know? Wow. And the reason why I say wow. that is because of the fact is, um, you know, is that if you notice, that was just the beginning stages of the um, Ku Klux Klan. You know, they were yeah. playing sax. And then, the bro- and then one of them said, said, um, said, um, <laughs> you know, next time, we'll wear the, you know, wear the full regalia. You know, the full regalia. Right. You know, and of course, you know, we know what that means. You know, if you, you know, ride on with the KKK, but obviously that was the origin because that was the first time that they used the sacks or the bags on their head. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's why they, they made like, comedy of it. Right, that's why, you know, they was like, man, I can't see shit in this thing. You know, cut <laughs> this shit off. You know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, so so, so that was probably one of the funniest scenes in the movie, right. though. To me, that I was dying yeah. laughing over that. That joint. was one. That was the funniest scene. But that's the reason why I said Big Daddy symbolized, in a sense, Albert Pike, Albert Pike. who became right, who became hmm. the um, you know, who was a general, but became the um, the southern 
you know, who became the head mason of the Southern jurisdiction, you know what I'm saying, of Scottish rights. And he also wrote the, anyone who knows this, wrote for the Prince Hall affiliation, also wrote the rituals for them. That I didn't the know. Prince Hall. Right, he wrote some of the prince, some of the rituals for the Prince Hall. And there's no coincidence that in Washington, D.C., they have a statue dedicated to Alvin Pike to this very day. You know, who was the founder, one of the founders of the KKK? So that was, you know, that was also symbolic to that. You know what I'm saying? And matter of fact, Forrest Gump in the movie was named after Henry Forrest, who was also a co-founder of the KKK. Okay. That's, you know what I'm saying? I definitely didn't know. You know well, I'm glad that we're having this convo because I've been feeling like maybe I've been losing my touch on blackness for the past week and a half to wait black people, them brown people been coming at me. I'm kind of like, yo, am I tripping? Am I st-? Like, I've actually started questioning myself like, dang, Dave, are you losing it? Are you getting soft? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm thinking about something. Like, I'm seeing all the symbolism, but everyone else is telling me that I'm tripping. Right. You know, right. so I'm like, you know, I'm thinking maybe I'm starting to sell out or something. I'm like, dang, so you starting to sell out? But now, you, now, what it is, like you said, we had to make a determination when we go and see it, if we're going to use our rational mental mind or if we're going to, you know, be emotional. And I chose not to be emotional. I wanted to see the symbolism because I know it was going to have some serious symbolism in it if they pumping this thing up and they're going to bring it out on Christmas Day. Yeah, and it was just like, you know, but even then, though, here, the question I have for you now, when you went in there, did after you was about an hour or so on the film, did you even see anything that even if you went in there emotional that would have had you on edge? No. Well when I not not me. You know, but I seen, you know, the way in which that you know, I noticed the way that the German, you know, um Doctor Schultz and you know, there's no question that he was named Doctor Schultz after, you know, um Charles Schultz, you know, character you know, who did the um you know, um Snoopy and all of them, you know you know Wow. So, you know, I don't That's think crazy. that was right. I don't think that was a coincidence with with them using that name either. You know, so wow. you know, I, that, I, that, I see that one right there. That's a good one. Right, you know, so Schultz, was, you know, happened to be that name that they wanted to use, and um, that connection. But you know, I don't think it was no coincidence. You know that um, you know that he was, you know, this, you know, in a sense, in the first part, you know, the teacher. You know, because that goes to what Prophet um, Noble Drali was saying is that I will leave the European here long enough in order to um, teach you government. And that's what he was right. doing. He was teaching Jamie the science of law. Yes, he was. All right? Right. Remember that. He, that's what he was doing. He was teaching him justice, law. All right? Eye for an eye, two for a tooth, the Old Testament type of shit now. <laughs> okay? Yeah, he really was. Right, right. He, he wasn't teaching him to turn the other cheek shit. You know, you see how Jamie got, you know, with the turn of other cheek shit. You know what I'm saying? When a dude was touching his um his stuff, you know what I'm saying? Jamie made sure that he said, you know, that he was one of the ones that he saved for last. And talking yeah, shit while he was and talk, right, and oh, talking yeah. shit. Right, and talking shit while yeah. he was showing him. <laughs> yeah, shot him in the balls twice. Not exactly. once, twice. Uh, exactly. You no, know, but, but that's the thing I think that, like, what happens in, in nowadays is that if people are going to get in, brown people are going to involve themselves in Hollywood, it's like, you know, start looking at the credits. And if you see a, a, a brother behind as a producer or as the, the screenplay writer, kind of sit back, and I, and I speak from personal experience because my cousin, my second cousin's name is Michael G. Moy, and he um, wrote Good Time, Jefferson, Sanford and Son, Different Strokes. And it was funny because as a child growing up, I would always see black symbology. Like, if you go look at old Sanford and Son episodes where, where Fred had a fez, and Fred had a, a, one episode, he had a, a picture of, of a Moorish, of a sultan, that was all my cousin. So that's what made hit me to know, like, yo, you know what, Some sometimes these brothers try to slide something in real quick. Oh, they kind of because, because even on there, uh, remember, they um even added in um that Fred said that um, we was the original Jews. We was the black Jews. Yeah. And my cousin wrote that episode. My cousin wrote I, know. That. I haven't talked to him in years. That's, that's, that's what I'm wrote the whole that. episode. And, and what about the scene so when Fred was in the courtroom and um he had the police up on the stand and he said, "Wait, you don't um 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 um, um you know you you don't um boy, how you said that shit? He said um he said, "Do you arrest any you know anybody else other than people you know?" That, I think he said something like, you know, anybody else of people of color? And he said, sure I do. You know what I'm saying? He said, well, where the at? Because it looked like, damn, there's enough niggas that hit the damn door. I'm just damn, 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 I'm just damn,
Superman movie. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like so we gotta pay attention to that, and that and that's right. the thing with this movie is that in reality, what Lesnar uh-huh. Hudlin gave was a stone cold superhero. Right. That's what he gave. I said my man walked away with a cigarette and whole nine. I was like he ain't he ain't had to scratch on toilet paper. Come on, man, let's go. Yep. He out. Come yeah, on, what more could you And even really danced the horse around a little bit before they jetted. <laughs> Forgot about that. I'm sorry. I forgot all about that. I'm yeah. like, so, you know, I, I just, yeah. but I think yeah. what yeah. happens yeah. is. You mean, so. Say that again? But you know what? Uh, you know the one I want to ask you, Dr. Ali, Bay, is, is what do you think about, like, I looked at Samuel Jackson's character on a very mundane level as, as um, what's my man's name? Set. That's who I saw him as. Right. On a very low level without going as deep on my end. Cause right. I'm lazy, but I looked at him and I was like, in particular, a lot of the things that he was doing with him verbally and so forth and so on, and I was just kind of like, you know, like for instance, I know, and I haven't figured it out yet, but it had to be a science by the six shooter, because when he, with my man, when he said, I got a six shots, nigga, and Jerry Fox said, I count two guns, nigga, so I'm like, okay, so in my mind, I'm thinking, what's the significance here? And I knew there was a significance, but I'm like, I at that point, I was like, all right, I'll figure this out. There was so much going on in that joint that I'm like. Davis were given a whole lot of stuff that I thought was fun and interesting. Right, right. Well, well, yeah. what I what I think that correlates to, you know, is the six ounces of brain in which that um, is stated that the um, European has. You know what I'm saying? So the fact wow. was that Samuel Jackson was using only six, um, you know, six ounces <laughs> of his brain, you know, in response to Jamie, and Jamie said, "No, there's 12. In other words, he was using twelve strands of DNA. Yep. Wow. You know, you yeah. Know what I'm saying? And, you yeah, know, so, yeah. So, right. So you know that's what we was talking about earlier about the indigo <laughs> children or the rainbow or the crystal children, how you know, um, how they begin to start using more than just um two strands of DNA. They would develop twelve. So Jamie said, Nah, it's twelve up in here. You see what I'm saying? In other words, <laughs> his, his twelve pair, his twelve pairs of cranial nerves also was activated symbolically to twelve pair and pair meaning two. So twelve pair, you know. Uh, 12 times 2 is 24. In, uh, in other words, as in the 24 elders, you know, that sits around the throne of God, which is symbolic to the pineal g- gland, the lamb. You know what I'm saying? So I think all of that was symbolic up in it, and how we know is because he said burgundy once again, which is the color of the third eye. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Or what is known as maroon or burgundy or um, or indigo. It's indigo children once again. But um, I got two callers that's going to bring on, let me see. Um, we got some questions. We got area code seven four seven. Area code seven four seven. Damn. Yeah. Peace. 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 Yeah. This is Peace. From Ron. Oh, I just want to know um, what, what your thoughts oh, is on on um, the type of dialogue that um, Django Jamie Foxx was using in the movie. Like, do you think he sounded like an unintelligent? Because I'm I'm having a uh, conversation with uh, you know my homegirl about the movie. She's saying she didn't she didn't think that um, you know he sounded like. She didn't agree that he was using correct dialogue that was appropriate for that time. Right. Well. Well. Down no, for man and things of that. So, which right. I just want to know what your thoughts. Right. Well, I mean, I mean, of course, you know, some people will rather that he talk like a slave. But remember, Jamie is from the South. Jamie was born and raised in Texas, so right. the accent itself is Southern. Okay. Now, yeah. the epithets in which that he used might not have necessarily been, but he was showing you how he have gone above. The um, language barrier in the dialect of the southern uh, of the southerners. You know what I'm saying? Right. Another of those who who that's why they kept emphasizing the language barrier. Remember when the um, when um, um, they rolled up on you know before the guy got eaten by the dogs. You know before the black. You know the um, yeah. Right. Remember the guy he was talking to. He was asking him. He said, "How long you been going?" He said, "Well, I've been going." Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then he was like, "Well, what, what you want us to do? Well, I'm been saying, but you need to go home." You know. So, wow. So, yeah. so that's why the emphasis was on the language because they were showing you. You know what I'm saying? That this is how the Southerners during that time talked because they was illiterate. You know what I'm saying? Over ninety yep. percent. Over ninety percent of the country was illiterate 400 years ago, yep. 300 years ago, 200 years ago. Okay. Of the country. Yeah. Oh man. And also what he was showing was that that he was not a negro, black or colored. Bingo. He was a yep. he was yeah, a sister that, when she started, the sister started so ghetto. Yeah. Didn't the sister sound so ghetto when she was like he's over yonder. 
She sounded so ghetto. He wasn't on that vibe. He was a god. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Remember, exactly. he had to remind exactly. um, um, ghetto girl that he was not a slave. <laughs> Did. Right. Didn't believe it. Right. <laughs> he didn't she ask like, to I'm kill like, the the brothers when um right. when the he, German came right. over there. They was already dead. Right. He he yep. did it on his own. He he killed the first two and then let um you know then let the German join in you know with killing the third one you know and right. he had to um say well yeah that's him. I said what you mean Are you positive? He said what positive mean? <laughs> and was, this was about being positive, God damn it. It was about them yeah, making sure. And he said, well, it means sure. He said, oh, well, yeah, I'm sure that's that motherfucker right there. <laughs> yeah, well, I did, I, after I watched it, I did have to go to my mother who was born out south because I swear to you, I learned something in that film. I said, Mama, what the heck is a nag? I said, they call horses nags. She's like, yeah, yeah, a nag is a third for a whole horse. <laughs> right, yeah, that's when, right. Because when Samuel said it, I said, what the heck? Is he like, what the heck is he doing on that nag? Mm-hmm. And that's what I was telling people about Samuel's character. I said, if you didn't see it, yeah, someone would tell you that he was the step in session. No, he wasn't. He ran that plantation. Then my boy listened to everything he said. He, I said, as a matter of fact, uh, the candy, the candy, whatever his name is, he had to actually stand up and stick his chest out before Samuel shut up. I said, in the very beginning, if you listen to the dialogue, Samuel's character was playing him out. He said, oh, did you miss me? He said, all this stuff. But the very last thing he said, is like a, a rocket, a, a pebble in my shoe I miss you. <laughs> and he just was pissing well, him the whole time. Thing. So, and see, the thing about Candy was is that if you notice his ring, he ha- he was wearing a Masonic ring. Yeah, there was a copy yes. of Square and a G on that ring. They showed it for just one or two quick seconds, and that was it. Okay. Yeah. So Samuel's ring? no, that was um that was um Leo um DiCaprio um Caprio um ring. Um, now when he got up, he did the fidelity sign. If you notice, when he left the table. He put his hand over no, his phone as he was leaving the table. And he was going to yeah. go and talk to who? Samuel Jackson, who was um, yeah. Stephen or Stephen. Hence, yeah. Stephen and Fe- um, Step and Fetch It. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's the reason why he was given that name, Stephen. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so he walked and so up he that goes to and was chilling. <laughs> right. So he goes to the library now. This is where they go to now is in this library where the lies are buried at. As a matter of fact, mm. that's where Leo Caprio, um, Mr. Candy, was dead at, killed at, was right. in the library, along with yep. his history, right. his story. And what was told to him before his story or before his murder or assassin or assassination was that Dear Moss, all right, who wrote the book on, or wrote the story on the Three Musketeers, right? Mm-hmm. Now remember, in the beginning they had to kill the the, the brittle brothers, who was three of them, the Shafers, and then at the end they go into the three musketeers. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Now the three musketeers was written by Alexander Dumas, and he tells them yes. that Alexander Dumas was who? Black. He was a, he was a black. He was like black. He, was he a, tells him this. <laughs> yeah. So he was telling him that his whole lies, where the lies are buried, that I'm going to dig it up. His favorite book, the the name that he gave to the slave, which was Alexander. That's who the slave who was eaten by the dog's name was, was Alexander. Yeah. And that's what made him feel yeah. so bad about what took place. And then the Germans shot his ass right there with Eliza buried that and then revealed to him the goddamn truth. Yep. And was willing to die. And was willing to die for it. Wow. He was willing to die for the belief because he knew that's what was getting ready to come. And he took you right and said, look, I couldn't resist. Shit. <laughs> wow. And, now what? Well, well, Right. Mhm. Well, you what, what was well, now? Here's now here's the thing for all the people that are still into the entertainment aspect of it. Here's a little thing that I found out from behind the scenes. What I found interesting, I remember as a filmmaker, I thought to myself, that's a very interesting choice because when Leo at the, when they were at the table, when Leonardo was finding out that they were well, after he found out that they had duped him, when he slammed his hand on the table, I said, wow, they 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 made him cut his hand. What's that about? And as I'm watching them more, I'm like, wow, they're gonna really just keep the bluff on. Well, what it is. And now I know why Kerry Washington did such a wonderful job in that scene was that what the producers of the film said that Leonardo was so in the character that when he slammed his head on the table, he really did um, give himself a gas when he had after he left had to get ten stitches. So what happened was he really smeared his blood in Kerry Washington's face. 
Mm. That's why Carrie was looking so crazy. When she, like, go back and look at her look. Because I was right. like, oh, that's some good acting. But right, now right. it's like, oh. Right. So that was they, they said, first of all, that wasn't even part of the scene. He was not supposed to grab her head or anything. But as an actor, I can understand you getting the moment. But right. so I looked at that because I, I always I was thinking like, well, that's an interesting choice as a filmmaker. Like, what was the significance of him cutting his hand? But uh, apparently, according to what the producer said, that nah, he really cut his hand, and that was his blood that he smeared all over Kerry Washington's face. Mm. I'm glad you cleared that up because I did not understand. I said, did he cut his hand when he was cutting the skull? It was not. What yeah, happened? It was not supposed to be a part of the scene. He just got into it, and because I've been there as a producer before, where like you, you know, someone's so into it. Like I remember this, like Sugar so we had we had LL Cool J on Rap City, and he was freestyle. I mean, L was in a zone. Problem was, ten seconds into his freestyle, the audio cut out. But no one stopped him because he was so he was going. And I've seen actors get in a zone where you know I've done that when I was in the Negro Ensemble Company. I grabbed the girl and shook her and called her a bitch on stage. And everybody was like, but I was so into that character that that that's what he would have done. So I found it very interesting, and I was like, Kerry Washington is a soldier because I don't know if I would have played that spirit of blood in my face. I mean, he smeared her up with it, and I remember we was like, oh, but. You know, so there was so much going on that, like, literally probably on that set, they had a lot of um, esoteric things going on that maybe some people caught. That was on set. Maybe other people didn't. That's and true. I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. But um, I'm glad we had this. Like I said, I, 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 mean, I swear, I, like, the past week, I was really questioning myself, like, yo, D, maybe you losing it, bro. Maybe you on sell out road, homie. Maybe you just maybe you tripping because back in the day that I, that a movie like this might have had me outraged, enraged, even though I never saw it. But you know now oh, I feel normal. <laughs> I feel normal again. Well, like you know I say, mean? the number three was used over and over again because the symbolism was triple stage darkness. The first three was used with them killing the three guys. The second three was with um, what we was just talking about. And then, of course, I'm leaving with the sisters, symbolic to three or her three trimester periods, and, of course, them producing the next hero. You know what I'm saying? So it mm. symbolized that, you know, triple stage darkness, I ain't so, I ain't Sophie Err. You know what I'm saying? Which that is above Keitha, which is above the crown or the top of the head. And that's why they kept, you know, um, showing, you know, the head so much, the head shots, you know, the symbolism mm-hmm. with the eyes, the head, and so forth and so on, um, the head or the skull on the table. Somebody to yeah. Keitha, you know what I'm saying? That's that's where um, that's where man um, thinks that he um, 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 originated at the mind. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know he thinks the mind is all because the mind symbolizes the light. However, the light comes from out of triple stage darkness. So there's something in which that is above that, and that's what that last scene was also symbolizing. So you're not crazy, mm. yeah. I mean, this just you know just the fact of the symbolism in which that they know about, you know, studying the Kabbalah and um, you know, Judaism and so forth and so on and you know, um these people, you know, they study that. You know what I'm saying? There's no doubt about it. They study I mean, Madonna um is a known um Kabbalist um student, you know what I'm saying? So I mean we, these are just things in which that we definitely have to um check out and analyze. Yeah, definitely, and, and and that's what I attempt to tell people all the time. It's like, look, man, I'm around some of these cats. Like, look, this conversation I'm having with you, I sat in a room full of actors that had the same exact kind of. I sat in front of people, some of people's favorite rappers, and be like, yo, and they would sit right there and be right in the middle of the conversation. And they hit me like, wow, I've, you know, I I tell people I've sat with um, a couple of the brown congressmen like three or four years ago, and and uh, one of the ladies worked for um, Hillary Clinton. And I sat right at lunch because they took, for whatever reason, they wanted me to come with them, and they paid for lunch and everything. And I told her about the DVD that I saw Ron Brown and how Ron Brown and how he really was shocked and they said out. And, and you know that woman sat right there and was like, yeah, we're aware of that. you know. And we talked about it. We talked about all the conspiracy theories. So I tell people, like, yo, the people you're talking about, they're aware of it. Right. Now, with the Green Mile, remember after um, Steven Spielberg did that? Not Steven. Not Steven, but um, Um, Richard. um, um, Stephen King. Yeah, Stephen King. He got hit by a truck because he was making a a brother, um, a Christ figure. So do you, you were talking about them creating this. You think they're going to be hurt too? Mm. Yeah, I mean. Brother D? That's a good point. Brother D, you there? He 
might not be able to speak on that. No, I think I don't know if it's I don't know if his phone is still on. Alicia, you know what somebody said in the chat room? What's that? He said you forgot to break down Yu Gi Oh. <laughs> oh, well, go to it, God. All right. Well, you see, I mean, Yu Gi Oh. I mean, it doesn't get any more comedic than that. I mean, that starts. Did you hear that one? Did you, your sons watch that or? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah they watched, watched that. Yeah, they watched it, no doubt. <laughs> okay, so I mean, it starts out basically, um, you know. Wait, go uh, ahead, Doc. It, no, what are you saying? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I mean, it starts out with basically this character named Yugi. And, um, you know, his grandfather has all these artifacts and statues and um, Egyptian, um, you know, I mean, just artifacts. Uh, and there's this thing called the Millennium Puzzle. Now, basically, there was a difference between Yugi and Yu-Gi-Oh! And um, it was either, it was Yugi who's basically like the... Um, Yugi is basically him as a human being, but the pharaoh, I think, was um, Yu-Gi-Oh, which was ba basically came out of the Millennium Puzzle. And as you see that, I mean, I used to rock that when I was, you know, really young. I didn't even know what it meant. But um, that Millennium Puzzle, which, I mean, it looks like the all-seeing eye type of thing. It's the eye of Horus. And that's where Yugi comes out, and it's a pharaoh. Mm. Another movie that dropped sinuses, too, that's in the cartoon, is Last Mimsy. That joint was real deep. It had the sinus of Reiki, Egyptology. See, Brad, I guess I shouldn't ask this question again because you got kicked out, but I still want to. Um, when the movie um, The Green Mile came out, y'all remember they um, they ended up hitting the... Um, the person who wrote it with a truck. Y'all remember that? Because he made the the brother of Messiah. John Coffey, J.C. So that was directed to you, um, d Bread. You know, I didn't. I can barely hear you, but I didn't see the Green Mile. I'm not a movie person, right? That's a comedy. I don't go to movies. Like, I didn't see the Green Mile. I've never really watched it. You missing out so I. So I definitely would have missed out on any symbolism because I think I've seen maybe ten. I think I've seen with the he was blowing the flies out of his mouth. Okay, okay. So you don't know, but that was that was a really good movie. It really was. It was it was John Coffey, which is a symbolic to the to the um, initials of Jesus Christ, and he actually was healing people through touch, which is a shaman African practice. So yeah, it had a lot of science in it. Yeah, it had my, uh, Michael Clark, Clark Duncan in it, right? Yeah, I think this. The Green Mile? I know, I liked it. Mm-hmm. All right, we're going to bring area code 314 on to the line. Peace. Peace. Area code 314. Peace. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Peace. Peace. Yeah, brother, brother, yes, sir. Brother, brother, brother Virginia L. from the uh, um, St. Louis, Missouri Republic. Yes. I've been hearing a lot of you goddess gods and talking all about the movies and the science and all, but uh, pretty interesting, you know. I was just glad I was, I mean, I was hoping I'd get on it earlier, you know, to kind of share a lot of this, uh, the symbolism with you. Can you still hear me? Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, brother. Okay, I don't know if everybody else can. I don't have... Have Aileen? Aileen, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Can you hear me, God? Yeah, Um, I didn't hear that last part. I, um, The phone are going in and out here. keep kicking off D-Brad. Right, the phone keep kicking off Brother D-Brad, and he calls us in order to um, try to get back going. But um, I didn't hear that last part. Go ahead, brother. Yes, sir, but I was, I was listening to what the, a lot of you uh, brothers and sisters were talking about, 
how you science up on the symbology of the movies, especially Django. And uh, yeah, I haven't, I'm, I still haven't get uh, yet chance to see it, uh, okay. but I'm trying to see it between this week and next week. Because the more and more you talk about it, the more and more I need to go see it. And uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, you was right. The brother was right when he said about the the Masonic uh, 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 nature of the movie. Because I was myself a past master of three years. I sat in the chair for three years as worshipful master of my lodge. And uh, the hat he was wearing was a hat of authority and sovereignty. You still there? Yeah, we here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yes, he did have a, a, some of the previews I saw of the movie, and he did have on a lot of blue, which represents the Blue Lodge. Right. And uh, 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 that was about all I could get from the previews of it, of the movie. Right. But uh, uh, I'm glad a lot of you brothers and sisters are really talking about it, about uh, the symbolism, and especially about uh, Kerry Washington. I, I don't... I know of the sister, but I don't know her. Right. So, well, that's why we brought Brother D. Brad on, because he knows her. He knows uh, her. Well, let me clarify. She's not like, if she saw me right now, she'd be like, and you are, and I would have to be like, you remember Natalie? And back in 2000, she'd be like, oh, okay. So it ain't like, I know her, like, we tight. <laughs> let me clarify, like, you know, I've been around her before she did what she's doing. Okay, you and the sister pretty tight, huh? No, we're not. Uh, oh, I, was, not? I dated, I know, I dated her, her uh, my ex-girlfriend, is was one of her best friends. Like we would be, we knew each other at that time back in two thousand, between two thousand one and two thousand three, when she was still in New York. And we would like she would see me with her girlfriend, and she knew me. Like, oh, hey, what's going on? Because that was my girlfriend. But once she went to LA, I ain't seen her since. Okay. So you know, I was around her in her early days. Okay. Mm. I was, I was kind of wonder what the sister like, you know, off 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 stage, you know. What are her political... um, from what I knew of her before, she was, you know, I mean, as far as personality, she was cool. Um, I just never saw anything overly special about her as a talent. Okay. But apparently, I was wrong. And I'm wrong sometimes. It is what it is. We all miss them. And I missed out. Right. I missed, you know, Carrie, right. because I just, you know, when she got Ray, I was like, wow, she's doing Ray. And the next thing I know, it's bigger and bigger and bigger films. And I'm thinking, I'll watch her in the films. Like, even in Django, I didn't, you know... I watched the Ray, and I was just looking and going, all right. But, you know, obviously there's something, you know, once Hollywood likes you and there's something about you that they like, they're going to keep going with it. Okay, right. You are right about that, Mo. Yes, sir. I was also hearing you talking about the uh, the seven, uh, dealing with the seven chakras. And it was yeah. going with the, uh, yeah, with the cartoon. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I was, I was going in on that. Yes, uh, I, I deal with the seven chakras, and you also talk about Shiva. Also, Shiva goes back to the uh, number seven. Also, that's like right. Say seven heaven. That's right. Uh, 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 and also uh, the Sanskrit deity Shiva, which means seven. Yep. Sure yes. Uh huh. I did go right. take me back to the circle seven, mm-hmm. and so on. Mm-hmm. <coughs> so the seven is a very, very powerful number. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the G in the ring um, in which that Leo Caprio or Mr. Candy War was, you know, um, the square and compass with the letter G in the center in which that is the seventh letter of the alphabet. Yes. Yes. Wow. Wow. Mm. I know my grand. This is, um, you know, number one girl was core sheeper. Wow. So the G symbolizes actually the compass of square actually symbolizes the vagina, you know, which is shaped, you know, like the compass and square. The, you know, that's why Washington D.C. is in between Maryland and Virginia or Virgin. Wow. Mary the Virgin. Mm-hmm. I never okay? did. Okay. And then that. what's the, now? Then what's in the center of Washington D.C. is the obelisk, the phallus, the penis. And that's definitely not by, by coincidence. No, <laughs> no, definitely not. Huh? I would, I, I would well, never sign that up. Well, I've I've heard that that's like um, they tried to make a modern Egypt in there, right? In uh-huh. Washington. 
so that's what that is. So they probably right. don't know. I mean, they probably don't know what they're doing. So we all we all know that Benjamin, man. right? Benjamin Banneke Bay was the, was the, uh, the designer of Moore. But he was a Moore, yeah. which I believe uh, Prince Hall was his co. <clears throat> Now I remember when Jamie Foxx pulled out the telescope, you know, well, not the telescope, but the um, well, yeah, the, what is it? Yeah, the joint, the little, that little, yeah, I, I forget what they call it, the little. I gotta joint. see that movie. I got to see that movie. Right when he pulled out the single binocular and he had on his blue, so he was in the blue lodge, the blue house symbolically. You know what I'm saying? So he was the master mason, and he pulls out the um, binocular, the single binocular that looked like a telescope. Um, that was Moorish. Yeah. Because the same scene was with Morgan Freeman. Now remember, he he was called Django Freeman, and in the same. <laughs> <laughs> hey brother, real quick, if you want to see it, it's the digital, bro. It's the same thing as in the theater. The site is called ZMovie dot net. It's right up there. If you got a nice TV at home, you can plug your computer in, whatever. Plug, you know, the USB joint. Don't pay to go see it. Don't get. I don't believe in. I, I occupy Wall Street. I don't. I don't yes, pay sir. for nothing. You know, they so. You know, and I think the thing is, I think things like this because, like, I work in performing arts with children, so I have a lot of time between. Uh, I work with kids from eleven, children from eleven to sixteen, and it's in particular, before I got on, when you all were breaking down the cartoons, things like this are very important. Really, like when it comes to us adults, in a way, it's kind of us just sitting around. But the real impact it will make is on those children because right. they watch all of this, like the cartoons. I would have a bunch of children sitting around me, and I ain't even go nowhere near as far as y'all did with, with when it comes to the metaphysical breakdown of cartoons. I'm like I simplify stuff like you know with the Incredible Hulk. I explain like you know if you understand the properties of chlorophyll and melanin, they're kind of sort of very similar. And after right. if you know, and if you know the background of the Incredible Hulk and you, Hulk, and you describe his attributes, well, if someone took that cartoon away, like, oh, he's always angry and he gets mad, he blows up. I'm like, yo, who you think they talking about? So I saw like little little JoJo across the street, local wild ass nigga over across the street, out of control. Cops mm-hmm. always chasing after him. You feel what I'm saying? Like, and you know, and the thing I would explain to children with Superman, I would ask them like, well, what's his real name? And, it's, and it ends in L. I forget. I think his daddy's name is Jar L. Whatever. And and I would explain that the from you know, from a certain amount of Morris science in that joint. And I was like, mm-hmm. even the cartoons where they talk about you know the oh, the Transformers or Superman, they come from another planet. I'm like, that's you know that's a culmination story that the Dogons used to tell about the Anunnaki mm-hmm. and things of that nature. And there you know, go. obviously Wonder Woman. I've seen the first as a riot, as a zero has the first Wonder Woman. I've read through it. They made her jet black, and I tell the little girls, think about it. Amazon. She's from the Amazon. Amazonians are dark. Couldn't be white with jet black hair. No way. You spy, you right. Know, right. You said now, you know, even something I thought I had my homegirls. So we was in the mall when the Green Lantern was out. And she didn't know the significance of it. And I said, what's that symbol on his chest? And they were like, oh, I was like, it's called the shin. They just superimposed two of them together. I said, his color is green, which represents, if I'm correct, the uh, green represents creativity. That's why that ring allows him to think, to create anything he thinks of in his mind. And I was like, so every one of these Go ahead. Go ahead, bro. No, go ahead. I was, cool. was going to say something, brother. I was going to say, like, right before you said Green Lantern, like a picture just popped in my head of Green Lantern. That's because we're on the same wavelength, D. <laughs> the, green, the green can also go back to the planet Venus. Right. Yes. As, as yeah, well. Yeah. You know, dealing with the, uh, what they call the light bearer. Right. The, yep. The, yep. The Ooh. Ooh. Well, Lucifer. see, see, you ain't have to go there with that. See what I'm saying? I, see, you remind me of, um, I, I was talking to another one of our elders, Brother Kaba, and I brought the Hulk. He started, he brought in Asura, and I said, see, you have to take it there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? But, this, but I think it's important for the children to hear stuff like this. Like, I, you understand? Like, I don't, with all due respect to the grown people that may be listening, I'm not really concerned because you are where you're going to be. But them babies, when they look at John, Django, like I said earlier, before you got on, bro, I said, man, I, my daughter's four, man. I said, hey, if I'm going to have her watch something fictional about slavery, she will watch Django. Because I know roots of six because I I transcribed that whole trial of my book where Alice Haley had uh-huh. to admit to that white judge that he stole that story. I I never had no culture in my family. So if I'm going to tell a fictional tale, let me 
have have the hero stories. Let me let my daughter see that you can get out of that. Because right. Bruce don't allow you. Queen don't allow you. Beloved don't allow you. So I'm like, I'd rather my daughter see this right here. I'll sit it right on that little watch. It. Right. And have no problem explaining to her the significance of the slavery around it. But she would pay more attention to that brother, that Moore, that Freeman over there. And the same there thing with these cartoons with Goku. Because children are into that. Like, my niece is heavy into, uh, uh, what's the Georgia was talking about Goku, I think it was. I forget the name of the cartoon. Uh, but I sat down yeah, and watched Dragon it with it one day. Right. Yeah, Dragon Ball. My daughter loves My Little Pony. And I was forced when I had a stomach virus for a day. And she's four, and I put on Netflix, and that saved my life. But you know what? After about the fourth episode, I was like, yo, they're doing, like, real magic. Like, uh-huh. these choices, like, for real. <laughs> and my little pony. Like, it's uh-huh. not, like, I'm sitting there watching, like, yo. Same thing with Tunstein. I'm like, I had to watch that, too. My daughter. I'm like, they're doing, like, real sorcery. Like, this is not a joke. You know what I'm saying? It's a uh-huh. cartoon, but my little pony, they do so much magic in that joint that it's like, this is real. You know what I'm saying? So I think yeah. it's very important that we throw it at the children so that they can get it and then they can go on and take what they're going to do with it. Right. And that's why I love y'all metaphysical breakdown earlier. That's why I was so into it where I was like, you know, I'm content just sitting listening because I was like, yo, the, the babies need to hear this. These young teens need to hear this because then it draws them in and it makes them use their imagination because, like, I have some children that, unfortunately, their parents have hit them in the head with Christianity so much that they don't see nothing, oh, it's especially not the little fun. girls. The little boys are more apt to go, really? Let me hear. But the little girls, once once mommy tell me Jesus, it's Jesus. That's all I believe in is Jesus. And I'm like, right, wow. too. Yeah. Yeah, no, like, I, I mean, uh, uh, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead. I was going to say, like, basically, I mean, before I even really realized what religion was, like, that was my shit. I mean, Dragon Ball. <laughs> so I just lived my life accordingly. And Goku, you know, I thought maybe there could be a dragon in the sky or something. You know, but at least that was more happier. <laughs> or that was at least more interesting than me than, you know what I'm saying, a white man with a beard. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, like, yeah. You know, they, um, and even real quick, another one who I love to get into cause I, um, is Dr. Strange. I'm like, if you've ever studied Pascal Beverly Randolph, you'll look at his photo. Don't look at a Doctor Strange book. I'm like, dog, they ain't do nothing but lighten his face up. He still lives in Greenwich Village. He still, I, I, I have Death to Disembodiment of Man. I have, um, I got like five Pascal Beverly Randolph books, and a lot of wow. the things that 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 Doctor Strange does. I'm like, yo, you can look at his books and and you'll see Pascal's talking about it. That's Pascal Beverly Randolph, which is why I say they, I've got. I think they made two Doctor Strange films back in the 70s, but I, they were, Marvel would not do another Doctor Strange. Actually, when I was in L.A., I went to a comic book shop because I was on this Doctor Strange kick, and it was really weird at one time because I would go to different flea markets and find, like, every episode that was, like, right after the one I got. Mm-hmm. And the dude told me that Marvel had bought out in L.A., like, literally all the Doctor Strange comic books because they were supposed to make a film. But I was like, they're not going to make that film about Doctor Strange because that's too close to the truth. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, what's next? You want to make something about Black Hermit? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. But a lot of these things, and the same thing, like, in my in the, in the my book, I put the interview I transcribed with Stan Lee, who created the X-Men. He said, oh, I made those. That was after uh, Black America. Right. He said that, that, that Professor X, the passive one, was Martin. And he said Magneto was based after Malcolm X. And I tell children that's why the only one who's who has who's indigenous would be Storm. And what are her powers? Nature. Right. Everyone else has built in the power. She's the only one who's natural at one. Which is also. So, mm, speak on it, guy. I'm done. Go ahead. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the the, the Reverend Randolph back in those days was called a mulatto. A mulatto. Uh, Back okay. in those days. Yeah. No. Yeah. His, his works are interesting to me because if I read them five times, I get five totally different things out of it, which mm. is really strange to me about his work. Like, I, I could not explain it to nobody because it's like, well, I read it a month ago and I thought this, but then when I read it just now, something completely different came to me. So, I, you know, I I love that brother because I, I, I don't understand. Yes, Anybody's work, he, I don't understand. Very, very deep <laughs> to the cult science. Yeah, he, and, and, but here's the thing, Doctor Strange. I have a lot of old episodes from the issues from the seventies and eighties, and he was using that. They were literally like reading his stuff and going, "Okay, well, we're gonna have Doctor Strange for this, that, and the other." 
We're gonna have them take them here. We're gonna go to this mystical. We're gonna go to this. Ad. It was it was it was ill. You know, I mean, so it's like this. So, so I tell the children, like even Captain America, my dad, when I was growing up, used to always tell me this story about my great grandfather named Elijah Bradley, who was a sorcerer, and he was like he got in this battle and he said he disappeared, and and there was a whole military thing. And then when I started reading on on Wiki Marvel about Captain America, lo and behold, they tell this story about this black dude named Elijah Bradley, and they said, oh yeah, he disappeared and nobody ever knew. So I called my dad and said, Pop, come here, read this. And by the time my dad ain't in the comics, by the time he finished reading, his jaw was on the floor. I said, ain't that what you used to tell me about having our great-grandfather? So I tell people, and that was based off of all the Tuskegee experiments. So it was like everything that our children see is like, nah, the same thing with Spider-Man. I was like, that black costume, people didn't even get what was going on. I tell the children, when you remember Spider-Man 3, what happened when that black costume got on? I said, Peter Parker got rhythm. He got cool. He could dance. You know what I'm saying? He had style. <laughs> <With the girl. laughs> yeah, it's just that the way they slanted the movie made us kind of look at like, oh, it's a negative. Like, nah, because I got the Secret Wars when that first happened. It was a black substance. That's all it was. Spider-Man touched his black substance. And whatever he thought it became, which we all know represents melanin. And, you know, and if everybody should break down, be able to break down Batman, the last one. And I would tell the children about that because they had it all wrong. Root for the cops. Like, nah, you were supposed to root for Bane. <laughs> I was mean, supposed to be Bane. Like, that scene right. on Central Park Ave, I told my mother, you know how many times I walked past 72nd Street? And I said, and that's exactly how them crackers are. And I've always thought, like, yo, man, just give me an a AK. I'm running up to the joint snapping all these crackers out these buildings. Mm-hmm. And I was like, so they just had us, gave us a slant to make us think, oh, the cops, hey, hey them cops in New York ain't beating nobody. If they, if they let every nigga out of jail, they them cops in New York is turning, telling, and running. But we were taught to look at Batman like, oh. And it's like, now nah, Bane was actually the savior. Bane was the one that was coming to, to, to free the people from the nonsense. Even if he had to break your arm to reset it right, that's what he was about. So it's like our children, I really feel strongly that a lot of these messages that, that we all speak should be going to the children. I think we kind of talk to each other too much as adults. You know what I'm saying? And it's just right. a humble opinion of mine. But I think the children are the ones because they're open to hear it. They need to because, and I see it, I don't know how many of you work with children, but when I work with them, I watch these parents lock their children in the same prison that they've been in. So if I feel a certain way about the word nigga, and I've explained to, I've sat with cats, and like, yo, it's obviously a vibration. Like, how did me and Aleem and a bunch of other people that we never even met, we all decided that at one point in the 80s that nigga was no longer going to mean ignorant and you was no, and crackers was no longer be able to use it. I didn't know these brothers in Texas. I didn't know the brothers in L.A., but we all came to the same thing at the same time. That's right. There's got to be a vibration behind it. Mm-hmm. Well, remember, but, they have the no hundred monkey no theory doubt. in which that if one monkey does something different, then all of a sudden it spreads throughout the whole, you know what I'm saying, diaspora. Yes. And so now yes. all the monkeys do the exact same thing. It's called collective consciousness. Yes, collective consciousness. Right, so we downloaded those yeah. principles from the Akashic Records, which is the Universal Library, in the 80s in order to try to put the pieces of the puzzle back together, get about our existence and who we actually were. So yeah. it's, no, it's no coincidence that in 1987 there was a um, harmonic conversion, which, yeah. was, um, um, uh, which was dealing with um, alignment of certain planets and which that brought this energy in. And mm-hmm. New Ages talk about this all the time, but they don't say that it started with us. Yeah. I used to say that that was, to me, until I looked at the, the, the Ethiopian calendar, and I think at the, according to the Ethiopian calendar, today's May is like May 6, 2005 or something like that. But I used to always say that, to me, if you talk about what 2012, quote, unquote, represented, I used to say that happened back in the 80s, back in between the 80s and the early 90s. Because at one point, you know, I remember my best friend, I said he was German. And when that whole, when, when hip-hop really started, that vibration used to hit us as brown people, he would sit in a room with me and my boys, and literally we would walk out, he'd be like, what were you guys talking about? And I would have to break down to him what we were saying. Mm-hmm. And no, and it was like you know we all remember how it was, and we had our own language, we had our own everything. But it's because you was talking about death, fresh, yo, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right to the crib, whatever, whatever. He, would, I told, I told my kids like, yo, I used to get, I got detention for speaking that in class. I called my man, homeboy. My kids were like, that's not. What are you talking about? You're after school. And I'm like, wait, she was like, use it in his, then because she got mad because she told me to use homeboy in a sentence, and I said, okay. Me and my homeboy are going to go hang out at the crib later on. Right. <laughs> and she was offended, like, what? Uh-huh. I was like, how dare you? So I 
to say. Some old Ebonic shit. First world order radio, final lead. Final lead. We are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Proceeding in levels in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Burn. Proceeding levels in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Burn. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. Burn. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Burn. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient history school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories, shit that works. <laughs>